Hello friends. Welcome to Fiction Domain. How are you all? So we are back with an interesting series on what if Naruto was Vessel of the Golden Dragon. Also be sure to subscribe and like this video. Now let's begin. It was another day in Kanoha as the village was ever so busy on this mid-afternoon day. The merchants and tradesmen were busy in the market district as they tried to sell their products to the people who would gather. Liveliness and cheer could be seen in this area as the people came to and fro to obtain goods that they either needed or didn't, so long as they got to see what was available today. This day was livelier than the rest, only for the fact that the upcoming festival was quickly approaching. The streets were exceptionally busy as many people came from all corners of the Land of Fire to experience the Grand Lunar Festival. This was a time of fun and excitement, although not too much excitement obviously, which thanks to the patrolling shinobi policing the village, making sure it was safe for the festival and its attendees. But so many people quickly massing as the day grew closer, the amount of shinobi patrolling was increased, as well as the rate of patrolling. Everywhere someone looked it seemed the more anticipation for the festival was showing, after all this festival was one which made dreams come true. However, not all of the populace was busy getting ready for the festival, in fact one person in particular was about to get a surprise that he never would have expected. This lucky person was also currently getting Chaz by a group of Chunin who were sent after him by orders of the Hokage. Said person though was cleverer than they gave him credit for as he soon disappeared from their sights, forcing them to all split up in search of this person. Now you might be wondering who this clever person is I am sure, well perhaps clever isn't the right word when describing him, but rather unpredictable. Stepping out from the shadows of the nearby trees, a young spiky blonde-haired child smirked in amusement at his chazer's plight. That ought to keep them off of my tail for a while. The child whispered in glee as he began to slowly emerge from the tree line. Now to head on back before Iruka-sensei finds me. It's a little too late for that Naruto. A calm yet angry voice stated behind him causing Naruto to jump in fright. Ah. How'd you find me Iruka-sensei? Naruto demanded as he shook in slight terror as his teacher's gaze was set on him. Why it's because I am your teacher, and so I know you better than those shinobi. Hiruka answered while crouching down to Naruto's level before pulling out some rope. Now then why don't we get back to class, and then we'll go see the Hokage about what you just did. Naruto was utterly terrified at how his teacher was smiling all the same while speaking to him. It was something that he had never came to enjoy and for good reason. Within a matter of minutes Naruto was back in the shinobi academy and tied up in front of the class again. To say Naruto was having a good day was a little misleading, as it was fine until he got caught painting the Hokage monument. Now then since everyone is back and accounted for the class will continue as planned and without any further incidents. Iruka announced with the last part being directed towards Naruto. Class for the most part was much like any other, with the class geniuses exceeding praise, while people who were like Naruto failed for the most part. Naruto had known for a while that because of his large chakra reserve that it would be difficult for him to do what others his age could do, so he would often stay after class and ask for the teacher's advice. Though that was when he didn't feel like pranking anyone afterwards though. The day would be one of those few exceptions where he wouldn't be able to do either of the two after classes ended today, as he was a dead man walking so to speak, so once class ended Naruto didn't even bother getting up. Instead he waited for everyone to leave and for Iruka to wave him over to him before moving on to the Hokage's tower. It didn't take long for them to reach the Hokage's tower where they soon found themselves in the third Hokage's office. The elder man just sighed as he knew that this wasn't the first instance where Naruto was called into his office. Naruto would you care to explain why it was that you decided to deface the Hokage monument by painting on it? Saratobi demanded as he inhaled the tobacco that was ignited in his pipe. Because one day I'm going to surpass each and every one of those guys as well as you old man once I become Hokage. Naruto exclaimed getting a bit of a surprised look from both his sensei Aruka and the third Hokage. And when that day comes everyone in the village will yelling my name. Aruka just face palmed in response, while Saratobi sighed. Naruto that does not give you an excuse to deface public property, especially one such as the monument. Saratobi explained. Normally if such a thing was ever done the person responsible would be sentenced to two years of community service, as well as paying a fine of about 2,957,921.93 yen. Hearing the amount Naruto instantly felt the shock and paled because of it. Of course, seeing as how you are still a minor, and I'm pretty sure that you don't want this information to reach certain individuals ears I'll give you another option. Saratobi offered making Naruto quickly refocus to the elderly Hokage. Instead you can clean up the monument that you have defaced, and you will have to assist the preparations of the Grand Lunar Festival that will begin in five days, the choice is yours. Knowing that the latter was best option Naruto took it and soon found himself cleaning up the paint that was all over the Hokage monument. 
Besides that, Wei was much safer than what could happen if he took the former, and just thinking about it made him shudder, which had been noticed by the other two individuals in the room, who knew exactly what he was thinking. I think I'll just take the last option. Naruto answered, and Saratobi then took the paper that had the amount of yen as well as the punishment on it, and crumbled it up and threw it away in the bin besides his desk. Very well Naruto, you will begin after class each day until the day of the festival, and I'll make sure that she doesn't hear a word about it, deal. Saratobi informed before confirming the deal between him and Naruto. Definitely a deal from me. Naruto answered. Then you may leave now, although Aruka could stay here for a couple more minutes I have the information revolving around this year's graduation. Saratobi asked. Aruka nodded and not wanting to stick around, or rather he couldn't, Naruto made his way out of the Hokage's tower, and he headed towards the Hokage monument. Once up there he found that Aruka was already up there with a bunch of buckets and washcloths. Getting started by grabbing one of each Naruto just hoped that word hadn't gotten to the hospital yet about what he had done yet. I didn't even know how much my prank nearly cost them. I need to be more careful when doing pranks now otherwise I might know what it's like to fly. Luckily for Naruto time was passing by rather quickly, but to him he didn't even notice it until Aruka told him. It had been two hours now and he still wasn't close to finishing, however, he was close to finishing the third's head. The reason as to why he started on this one was because he knew that the old man didn't like what he had done to it, and Naruto was not willing to risk anything that the old man could do. Even though Naruto knew that the third Hokage wouldn't have done anything, it was also sort of out of courtesy for the old man, considering that he did run the entire village, which Naruto could only guess was hard, considering how at times he noticed that Saratobi was stressed out a lot of the time. Naruto didn't have to look up to know that Aruka was watching him work, after all this is something that has happened before, although just not in this situation. Hiruka noticed that Naruto gave a quick glance up towards him before returning to work. You don't leave here until every drop of paint is gone. Hiruka stated. So? It's not like there's anyone waiting at home for me right now, and considering they're still working, I won't probably get to see them until the day of the festival. Naruto muttered unintentionally loud enough so that Hiruka could hear it. Though Hiruka didn't admit it he understood Naruto a lot more than the kid knew. He saw himself in Naruto a lot and knew how busy his guardians were, so Hiruka decided to do something for his student. Hey, Naruto, tell you what if you hurry up and finish I'll treat you to some Raymond. This got Naruto's attention right away as he was quick to respond with an okay, followed by an intense cleaning montage. Seeing how determined Naruto became after mentioning his favorite food, Haruka could only chuckle at Naruto's antics. If only you were as enthusiastic with school, you might have even been able to give Sasuke a challenge. Haruka thought to himself before thinking about his other student for a moment. He had heard about the recent event that transpired over there at the Ichiha clan district and hoped that his student was okay. Switching back to Naruto he noticed that he was now working on the fourth's head and guessed that it wouldn't take long now. Sure, enough due to the encouragement that was Raymond Naruto had completely cleaned the Hokage monument within just two more hours. This meant that it was right around dinner time and the perfect time to go and get something to eat. It didn't take long to get to the Raymond stand, and with that time flew by for both Naruto and Aruka, as well as a good amount of Aruka's hard-earned money. Several days have passed now and Naruto was all but exhausted. Having to set up multiple booths as well as placing decorations all around key areas of the village and having to help with the floats has taken its toll on the young boy as he was beyond tired. Looking around though Naruto did feel good about seeing how everything looks. All that hard work really paid off, thanks again kid. One of men from the festival committee expressed his thanks. Too bad I can't pay you. It's no big deal, technically I'm the one who is to blame for that, but I will say that looking around it does look really good. Naruto stated to which the man agreed. Tell you what kid if you come back and help again next year, I'll pay you pretty good considering how well you did this year. The man stated to which Naruto just grinned. Thanks, but that all depends on what I'll be doing next year, seeing as how I plan on graduating from the academy this coming year. Naruto explained. Oh, then I wish you luck in your future career. The man stated before watching as Naruto got up to leave. Waving goodbye to the man as well as a few of the other guys who were there, Naruto made his way homeward. Tomorrow was the Grand Lunar Festival, and Naruto needed to make sure that he had everything. He acquired a new orange and black kimono from a nice old man the other day, and was now looking for something very specific, a glass orb that when held towards the moon, will allow you to make one wish, so they say. It wasn't really guaranteed, and it was more for traditional purposes, and that it has been one of the key parts of the festival. Everyone receives their orb at some point in their life, and usually when their chakra can be fully manipulated by another person, which is usually when they are very young. The orb itself is made from their chakra, as well as some of material of course, but it is made specifically for that one person. There are no duplicates even if someone has a twin, which makes them even more special. 
the orb's purpose in the festival is meant towards the end of the festival, when the crescent moon was at its highest peak in the night sky. Once it was there the orb would be held up in front of the person's eyes, allowing them to hopefully see shooting stars and be able to have a wish granted. If in the orb you spot three shooting stars your wish comes true, if you only see one two stars, then you will have good luck until next year, and if you see only one then you will have bad luck until next year. It was rather simple and something that everyone does, as both shinobi and civilians alike all hope that they can see three shooting stars. Naruto was heading towards the glassmakers to get his own orb and hope that either he'll get good luck tomorrow night or even a wish. Though he knew the odds that a wish coming true were slim to none, but considering no one has ever seen more than two stars through the same orb for over 200 years, there was always a possibility out there. I hope that the shop is still open because I don't want to wait until next year to see if I can get a wish. Naruto stated aloud, he tended to do that although he has been working on fixing the considering it wasn't wise to speak your mind so casually. Maybe I'll get lucky this year and get some good luck, it would really help improve my chances for this last upcoming year at the academy. Once he did reach the shop though his mood had seriously dropped. The reason being was because the shop sign said closed and everything seemed to be locked up. Naruto couldn't believe his luck, he really wanted that orb, but now it seemed that he wasn't getting it this year. One of neighboring merchants who had been counting today's profits noticed Naruto and yelled out towards him. Hey kid if you're hoping to get your orb made you're out of luck, the man who makes them has got nil and probably won't get better for the next couple days. Naruto just felt that whatever hope that he could get an orb vanish and was instead replaced with a small amount of depression. Is there anyone else in the village that can make my orb? Naruto asked. Not unless you want to go to Tenzaku town, there's someone there, but I doubt that you can make it there before they close up shop tonight, and considering that tomorrow's the festival no one's going to be open. The merchant answered. Naruto was really hitting the dumps now, but decided that he ruined his chances at getting his orb when he went and painted on the Hokage monument. Cursing himself Naruto decided to call it a day, but before he left he thanked the merchant before heading home. Walking down the streets of Kanoha was a bit crazy as it was the day before the festival, and so Naruto took to the back streets, where he could hope to make it to his house in time before it got too late. The thing was though that he couldn't help but notice all the families that were crowding the main streets. He wished that he had his parents, he had nothing against his guardians, but they weren't around as much as he wished they were due to their occupations. Though when he did feel alone he always had a feeling that he wasn't. He didn't know why that was, but he always knew that there was always someone there watching out for him when his guardians couldn't. A guardian angel perhaps, although Naruto really didn't believe such things, perhaps someone who knew his parents. The only reason Naruto figured this was because of an incident a couple years ago where he was supposedly a part of a tragic accident, even though he couldn't quite remember it. The real part of the information that he did receive was that someone had saved him from dying before disappearing, since then he's always had that feeling. Whether he should be grateful or not he didn't know, only that he was glad to be alive. Quickly realizing that it was quickly getting dark Naruto decided to speed up heading home. Well better get going, no classes tomorrow, so that means that I get to enjoy the festival all day long. Naruto cheered as he raced home. Not too far away a shadow danced across the walls before disappearing with its master. A dark figure was following Naruto, although out of sight where they wouldn't get noticed. The figure continued to follow Naruto and watched as he made it home safely before stopping. The dark cloak was wrapped firmly around the wearer's body concealing their identity. Waiting for Naruto to get to his front door the figure began to shift around as their arm reached for something under their cloak. Taking the object out it was revealed that the person had pulled out a small box that was wrapped up. Looking back at Naruto who was busy speaking with the elderly landlord the figure jumped over towards Naruto's window. It only took a few seconds before they were finished with what they had intended to do and proceeded to leave the area without a trace. Having just into his home Naruto decided to get something to eat when he thought he felt something familiar. Going to the source he entered his bedroom only to find it empty. I swear if they turn out to be a stalker I'm going to the Hokage. Naruto stated before checking over his room one last time before shrugging and going back over towards his kitchen. Fully unaware that the small box was laying on his dresser that was adjacent to his bed. That night Naruto had been busy trying to figure how to perform the standard clone jutsu. It was still one of the weakest of the few jutsu he knew, however, he wanted to get better at it so that he doesn't fall behind Sasuke any more than he already has. Ugh, why is this so hard? Why do we even have to learn this stupid jutsu it's not even that great? Naruto complained. Having had enough after two hours of trying to do the jutsu Naruto decided it was time to call it a night. I'll just have to wait for him get back to the village before asking for some help with this jutsu. After having a long day Naruto went and took a shower before heading off to bed. Once out of the shower Naruto was in his room getting into his pajamas and going through his closet. 
Getting his kimono out for tomorrow as well as some other articles of ceremonial clothes and objects, Naruto double-checked everything before finally heading off to bed. Meanwhile the third Hokage had just finished his paperwork when he finally felt the chakra signature disappear from the village. Seems as though you still can't bring yourself to face the child. Saratobi sighed as he brought his pipe up to his mouth so that he could inhale the smoke of the tobacco that was burning within it. You're going to have to face him eventually, because eventually he will come take this position. Once he's done that you'll have no choice but to face him then. It was then that knock resounded from his office door, and curious as to who it was at this hour Saratobi spoke up, come in. Following the command the door opened to reveal another elderly man, but this one had a cane and a series of bandages covering up the right side of his face. Instantly recognizing his old rival Saratobi, eyed the man carefully as he made his way towards his desk. Saratobi. The man stated, it wasn't a greeting, but rather it wasn't meant to be one. What is it Danzo, normally you wouldn't bother to come and see me so late unless it was urgent. Saratobi stated. My reason is the safety and well-being of the village Saratobi. Danzo countered. Danzo was serious it seemed, and Saratobi had hoped that whatever the man would be telling him would not cause him a serious headache. It must be important since you came when so few people would be around. Saratobi started. This wouldn't be about asking for certain individuals to join right now would it? For once that will not be an issue tonight instead this will probably be the one night that I will not attempt any form of argument with you. Danzo answered. This got Saratobi completely by surprise, although he didn't show it. How severe are we talking about Danzo? Saratobi questioned as he became gravely serious. Danzo took note of change and knew that the old Saratobi he fought with was back in front of him. It will seem that we can no longer delay the inevitable, war will be coming soon, and it appears that we will no longer be able to stop it from happening. Danzo explained, Saratobi instantly realized what Danzo was saying and didn't even need to hear the next few words to know what had just happened. The Kaiubi Jinchuriki has succumbed to death. Having woken up Naruto knew today was the festival and couldn't wait. Well since I can't get a wish I'll just have to enjoy today the best I can. Naruto grinned as he grabbed his kimono and got ready to head out. As he was heading out of his room he finally noticed a small box on his dresser. What the heck is this? Looking at it more carefully Naruto tried to open it, but for some reason he was unable to. Why isn't this opening? It is a box, right? Naruto asked aloud to no one in particular. Trying again Naruto noticed a note that had been underneath the small box. The note read as such. Wait until the moon is at its highest and then open the box, and you might get lucky. Infused at first Naruto just decided whatever and got dressed and stuffed the small box in his kimono's right pocket. Grabbing his wallet and apartment key Naruto began heading out of his apartment. Once outside he bumped into his landlord who was an elderly woman who greeted him. Good morning Naruto, are you heading out to the festival already? You can believe it, after all there's no academy classes today, so that means I can have fun all day long. Naruto expressed his joy to which the elder simply chuckled and waved him goodbye as she saw him off. Naruto was only a few blocks away from where the festival was being held at, and he quickly made his way in that direction. Along the way he saw a bunch of people he recognized either from his class or from his adventures around the village. There was so much to do at the festival Naruto didn't know where to start, but first thing first he needed to meet up with somebody before he could do anything else. Heading over to the most likely place where he could find this person it came to no surprise that he found them there. Sitting in front of the ladies' hot spring was an older man with long white spiky hair, running all the way down his back. He was giggling as he was looking through a small peephole in the wall. Naruto just sighed as he made his way over to the man, and without getting the man's attention, Naruto stuck his right index finger in his mouth as to get his saliva on it and pulled it out. Within seconds of doing so Naruto quickly stuck his lubricated finger into the older man's ear and yelled at the same time, stupid Iro Sanin. Quit peeking. The result, which Naruto was hoping for, was all too enjoyable. The sudden wetness in his ear along with the sudden loud yelling that was right behind him caused Jiraiya to jump as he was surprised before angrily bopping his godson in the head. What the hell Gaki? Why did you do that? Jiraiya yelled back in annoyance. Naruto just gave him a grin after rubbing his head. How else was I going to get your attention, considering you were too busy starring at those ladies, or did you forget what today was? Naruto grinned as he watched Jiraiya fidget with his ear. Jiraiya was still a little mad at his godson, but he shouldn't have let his guard down so easily, especially since she was still in the village. However, not one to let something like this go scot-free Jiraiya decided to scold Naruto. You still don't go and do what you just did to people. One of these days one of your pranks will tick off the wrong person, and then what will do? Jiraiya berated as he tried drilling what he had just said into Naruto's thick head. I'll worry about it then, you got to learn to have more fun you Iro Sanin. Naruto replied. Aki. Why I ought Jiraiya started before suddenly he was interrupted by the sounds of death. 
Bireya, what do you think you were just doing? A calm yet demonic voice asked the white-haired man who instantly paled at the recognition of the voice. Turning around Jiraiya met the gaze of one of his oldest and closest friends, who was the embodiment of death at the current moment. Tsutsunade. Jiraiya tried to speak, but instantly noticed her hair was wet. It was then that he recalled noticing someone in the hot spring he knew. Why I was just meeting up with Naruto, and we happened to have just ran into each other. Jiraiya looked over towards his godson for support, but found that he had disappeared, looking back towards Tsunade gawked as Naruto was saying hi to both Tsunade and Shizune, who had just come out of the hot spring herself. Naruto then looked over at Jiraiya and gave him a deadpan stare. Don't get me involved in your stupid situation. Jiraiya just paled as he heard knuckles popping, and Jiraiya knew that there was no escape now. Not even 10 seconds later most villagers would report that they thought they saw a strange flying object soar across the village. After returning from orbit Jiraiya now sported a black eye and a broken arm, but for the most part he was lucky. Lucky that since Naruto was there Tsune didn't beat him nearly to death as much she would have if he wasn't there, which was something that he grateful about. Walking through the streets of Konoha was quite enjoyable as the variety of stalls, activities and games was enough to keep Naruto distracted, while Jiraiya kept close to him in fear of being nearly killed by Tsunade, who would send him a death glare from time to time. For the most part the activities were enjoyable as the group enjoyed winning games, activities, and participating in the festival. Naruto was really enjoying it because this was one of the few chances that his godparents would have enough time to spend an entire day with him, aside from Shizun who would always check up on him. Right now, they were enjoying the parade when someone appeared to deliver a message to Tsunade and Jiraiya. The Anbu delivered the message to Jiraiya and Tsunade from the third Hokage. Naruto noticed how his godparents' attitudes changed and could only guess that something bad had just happened. Tsunade told Shizun to take Naruto and enjoy the festival, and that's what they did, while Jiraiya and Tsunade went to see their old sensei. Shizun for her part wasn't necessarily worried about having to watch Naruto, it was the part in which she had to try and keep up with it she had a problem with. The small blonde was full of energy, always has been, and she was nearly getting exhausted from just trying to keep up with him for no more than two hours. She understood how Naruto was easily able to avoid getting captured after a prank went wrong or he got caught, but still she was a seasoned shinobi taught by Tsunade herself, and yet this small blonde-haired kid was besting her endurance. For the most part the festival was fun for Naruto, although he had wished Tsunade and Jirei were still with him, after all he doesn't get to see them that much, and they had originally planned on spending the day with him. After all, Jiraiya was his godfather, and from what he got from that confusing conversation with Tsunade, they are related because of the Uzumaki and Senju clans were closely related. The only problem with that though he had more chances to see her than Jiraiya, she was still the head doctor for the Kanoha hospital, so usually he only got a chance to see her every other week or so. Noticing how much time has passed Naruto decided to slow down his pace, much to the relief of Shizun, who took a break on a nearby bench to catch her breath. Sorry for tiring you out Shizun. Naruto apologized. It's fine Naruto, it's just I don't have as much energy as you do is all, so it can become a bit of a challenge trying to keep up with you. Shizun replied with a tired smile. Naruto though didn't feel that much better for tiring her out, so he went over to a nearby stall and got her a drink. After obtaining the drink Naruto ran back to her as quick as possible and gave her the much refreshing drink. Arigato Naruto that makes me feel a little bit better. Shizun thanked to which Naruto just grinned. Looking at the time, Shizun quickly realized that it was almost time for viewing part of the festival, and told Naruto that he should head up to somewhere high, so that he could get the best view of the moon. Knowing that he didn't have an orb Naruto just decided to go with it and not worry Shizun about the fact that he didn't have one, so he left for the very place that he had recently pranked this past week. Many people he had passed along the way were getting ready as they pulled out their orbs. All of the orbs seemed to radiate differently than those around them, and Naruto took note of that as he continued on his way. Hurrying up to the top of the monument, Naruto noticed that a lot of people were gathering now that the main event of the festival was starting. Naruto just kept climbing the stairs to the top as he hoped to get a better view. It took no longer than a few minutes for him to reach the top, and from there he saw the crescent moon begin to shine past the clouds that had blocked it earlier. It was larger than normal and with a light blue tint to its luminescent glow. Seeing the moon like this did feel sort of magical, but it was just a shame that he didn't have an orb. Naruto was so deep in concentration that was on the moon that he nearly forgot about everything else when it hit him. Reaching into his pocket, Naruto pulled out the box, and to Naruto's surprise, the box seemed to glow in the moonlight. Seals that were present on the box disappeared, and Naruto heard a click. Essing on what to do Naruto grabbed the top of the box and pulled it off revealing a note that Naruto looked at. Naruto, this was made before you were born, it was made especially for your first time. The note started. Picking it up Naruto saw what it was underneath and was completely surprised. 
There situated in the ceremonial box was an orb, one that did not glow. Reading the rest of the note Naruto learned why it wasn't glowing. This orb was pre-made just for you, so that when have reached the age that you can start manipulating chakra, all you have to do is put a little bit in, and it will be yours. Your parents were very anxious as they wanted to make sure you had one. They really did love you Naruto, never forget that. Naruto was having mixed emotions while reading this note. At one point he was happy, and another part of him was sad that he didn't get to spend this time with his parents. Putting the note aside Naruto reached for the orb which was rather light and looked at it. Remembering all those lessons from the academy as well as from Tsunade and Jiraiya Naruto, tried putting some of his chakra into the orb. At first nothing happened, which disheartened Naruto at first before noticing the faint orange glow that emanating from it. It was faint at first, but then it expanded further to the point that it was the brightest object around him. Seeing this Naruto stopped and watched as the chakra within the orb swirled before faint changes to orb began to appear. The base color became a light shade of orange, while the glow became much lighter. The inside was no longer cloudy, but instead see-through which made Naruto even more excited as he watched the light die down. With that the changes were completed, and the orb's glow had died down to a bearable level. With this I can finally see if I can get my good luck or even a wish. Naruto cheered. Quickly bringing the orb to his eye Naruto looked towards the moon in hopes of seeing some stars. For the first few minutes nothing happened, but then Naruto saw it a shooting star. That was the first one, so far Naruto was going to be getting bad luck, and he really hoped that wouldn't happen. A couple more minutes passed before he finally saw the second one, and to his joy, it wasn't his eye trying to mess with him after swapping eyes. Two shooting stars were visible to him now, which meant he was going to be having good luck this year. Overjoyed at this Naruto jumped in the air cheered for who knows how long before he decided to look for the last time. The moon was starting to disappear behind the clouds again, which meant that the festival was coming to an end, but Naruto hoped to see at least a quick glimpse at a third shooting star. Though he continued to look time went by, and the moon was almost gone along with the shooting stars. Well I guess there is a reason why people say that no one ever gets lucky enough to get a third shooting star. Naruto said to no one in particular. Deciding to leave Naruto looked at the orb and noticed that it was still glowing. Thinking back to what the elderly landlord told him if the moon disappears the orbs will stop glowing, but for some reason his was still glowing. Confused Naruto at first thought he broke it, but then he looked up and for some strange reason he felt that he should look one last time. Doing so Naruto eyes widened. There along with his other two stars was another third star, not knowing how to react to this Naruto just stood there shocked trying to register what he was seeing. Quickly deciding that he should make his wish Naruto did just that. I wish to be strong, strong enough to be recognized and to protect those close to me. Naruto begged hoping that would be enough. Looking over at his orb he noticed that it light had faded and Naruto looked up and could no longer see the moon. As though waiting for some weird feeling or perhaps something strange to happen to him, Naruto found neither happening. Realizing that perhaps wishes didn't work like that Naruto felt a little disappointed at this and decided that his was probably for the best to go and find Shizu now. Making his way towards the stairs Naruto thought he saw something in the corner of his eye. Touring in that direction Naruto thought he saw a shooting star, but this was different it seemed to be getting closer. As though realizing that it was coming his way Naruto began to freak out because a shooting star was coming straight at him like it had a grudge against him. Running as fast as he could Naruto wasn't able to escape its path and was caught in the impact. The next thing Naruto knew he was surrounded by light and fell into unconsciousness. Before he succumbed to the impact Naruto thought he heard something like a voice. The darkness is starting to set in. Let it take you. Meet him there. Darkness. Darkness is all that I can see. Cold is all that I can feel. Came the strange sounding voice, as it seemed to resonate three times. To fall so far and fail all the while. Hardly a king anymore, but a shadow of my former self. Waking up Naruto found himself in a weird place. It was dark and cold and there were so many stars glittering the night sky. The ground below him was nothing but rock and the land was barren of any life. Where am I? Naruto wondered. He had never seen a place like this before. A child no less, truly this is the work of a torturous force, one bent on humiliating me even further. Came the voice again. Looking around Naruto saw nothing and nobody at the same time. Show yourself you coward or do I have to come after you? Naruto yelled out to the darkness of the night. Perhaps this child isn't as pathetic as I thought demanding me to show myself. It came again, although this time it seemed much closer than before, and yet Naruto still couldn't see who it was that was speaking. I'm warning you I'm going to be Hokage one day, and if you think that I'm afraid of you, then you have another thing coming. Naruto yelled out receiving an eerie chuckle from the person. Let's see if you can still be so brave once you've seen my might. The voice bellowed as the ground seemed to shake and lightning cracked around him. A large storm had formed above him with lightning flaring and the wind howling all the while, Naruto was still trying to get a clear view of who this person was. 
The clouds began to move out of the ways as the sky ignited and flames trickled the air. These flames danced and waved as they flowed to a central point where they would take form. Naruto wasn't believing what he was seeing, it was almost too fantastic to be true. The flames had formed together and with a clap of lightning, a being took form within this world. The being was very large with golden scales covering all over its body. It had two large prominent wings of sorts that appeared leathery, stiff, and giving Naruto the impression of something that would swipe him over in seconds. There were three distinct heads, each attached to an extended neck. It had no arms but two strong and powerful legs, with what appeared to be half talon like claws on its feet. And lastly a tail that towards the end split into two. Naruto was mesmerized by the creature before him, as he had never seen or heard about anything like it. Noting the look on Naruto's face the creature grinned at how the boy was in awe of his power, as he should be. I am the great god of destruction, the king of terror, and planet killer. I am King Ghidorah. Ghidorah announced loud and proud. And you child will be my vessel. The past few minutes seemed to have left Naruto completely confused, dumbfounded, and worried. During those same few minutes King Ghidorah was wondering whether his vessel even understood what was happening. They had been there for a few minutes now, and his vessel hadn't replied once since he stated who he was. Hey brat, are you deaf or just too stupid to understand anything I just said? King Ghidorah asked trying to break the ice. Naruto's expression though hardly changed, and Ghidorah was starting to get annoyed. You stupid monkey you had better answer me. That got Naruto's attention as his expression changed, and a frown was adorned on his face. Who are you calling a monkey? You stupid lizard. Naruto shouted back resulting in a loud and a monstrous roar being quickly directed towards him, which nearly sent him flying across wherever he was. How dare you insult me? I am a being who can wipe out all life on this planet, and I can kill you right here and now. Ghidorah roared in anger. To Ghidorah's surprise though Naruto didn't falter, but instead stood his ground even though his body was shaking. If you plan on hurting anyone then you're going to have to go through me. Naruto exclaimed as he tried to look as tough as possible in front of Ghidorah. Ghidorah just laughed at Naruto, who looked pathetic in his eyes. You think that you could fight me and win don't make me laugh, your body is shaking in fear. Ghidorah started as he got closer to him. You lack the ability to kill without remorse, and I can tell because your eyes reveal your weakness. Eh so what if I'm weak? A Hokage protects their village, and since I will become the future Hokage I will defend it with my life. Naruto tried to state without sounding too weak as he knew that he was starting to stutter. Ghidorah just chuckled as he knew he was going to enjoy his stay. Old words boy. Too bad you don't have the confidence to back them up. Ghidorah's three heads were now on either of Naruto's sides, making it more claustrophobic as Naruto quickly realized the size difference. Luckily for you I can't kill you. W what do you mean Naruto asked as he was still intimidated by Ghidorah's sheer size. It appears whatever forces placed me inside of your body have also created a countermeasure that prevents me from causing you any harm. Ghidorah stated as he retracted his heads back to their previous positions. A shame too because I would have enjoyed torturing you into a slow yet extremely painful death. Naruto was rather terrified as he didn't understand much other than that this King Ghidorah was inside of him, which means this was his mindscape and that he didn't want anything to do with Naruto. If you don't like me then why don't you leave Naruto forced out as he wanted to know if there was such a way to get rid of this monster. Oh, trust me. I would enjoy nothing more than to be set free upon this world and ultimately destroy it, but alas, it seems as though that there is an unknown force keeping me inside of you. Ghidorah hissed as he hated his current situation. Trapped within a living prison that should have die, then so will I. What's more my powers have seemed to have degraded from my last battle. What an annoyance. Battle who would even think about fighting something as big as you. Ghidorah looked back at Naruto and said person quickly wished he hadn't asked as he saw the hatred that was burning in Ghidorah's eyes. Leaning forward to make his point, Ghidorah was once again staring down at Naruto directly in front of him. A fool whom I want to crush and ultimately kill. The killing intent was radiating from Ghidorah as he spoke with malice and bloodlust. In the future it would be wise to keep your questions to yourself, lest you wish to feel my wrath. Unable to find the strength to speak Naruto merely nodded his head. Seeing that the boy understood King Ghidorah relented his killer intent and backed off. Feeling the great weight finally being lefted, Naruto was able to breathe again. So what am I supposed to do now that I know that you're inside of me? Though about your business as usual, I could care less. Ghidorah answered. So long as you don't speak a word about me being inside of you that is. The warning was there, and Naruto was taking the hint. He would not mention a word to anyone lest he deal with this monster's wrath. I actually have one last question. Naruto hesitantly asked causing Ghidorah to growl his disapproval causing Naruto to shrink where he stood. How do I get out of here? You're asking the wrong kaiju for that, if you recall I can't leave this area. Ghidorah bellowed. 
Naruto wasn't having a good day, all he wanted was the power to become stronger, but instead he got a giant three-headed dragon who is everything but pleasant. Suddenly something clicked into Naruto's thoughts as he looked at the dragon with curious gaze. Ghidorah noticed the change in Naruto's posture and was slightly annoyed that he wasn't cowering still. You're really strong right? Naruto asked Ghidorah making the gold dragon scoff in response. I've destroyed planets and conquered many races, so yes I am strong. Ghidorah stated rudely though Naruto didn't care about that part, which made Ghidorah slightly curious as to what the boy was thinking. Surely this child doesn't think that I would willingly serve him just because I'm stuck inside of his body. Okay, I've finally decided what we're going to do. Naruto announced causing Ghidorah to be taken back with a sudden loud outburst full of enthusiasm. You had better realize quickly that I will not serve you just because I'm stuck in here boy. Ghidorah was quick to express his view. I don't want you to serve me, I just want you to help me become stronger. Naruto explained. This was not the kind of response that Ghidorah had expected from a humanoid, sure most races would have been quick to make a slave out of him if this situation was anywhere else, but apparently Naruto was defected in some way. Um again Ghidorah needed to clarify that what he had just heard was what he heard and not something else. I want you to help me get stronger, that way I can reach my goals even faster. Naruto expressed in his happy-go-lucky demeanor. Ghidorah was now fully concerned as his current vessel was indeed broken. What's with a weird look, does it come to as a surprise? You're what I wished for right? Wishing what are you talking about? Ghidorah demanded. He didn't believe in such a thing, only weaklings like the one he was inhabiting would do such things not him. He had ceased with such things long ago. I made a wish during the Grand Lunar Festival after seeing three shooting stars before I was hit by one of them and ended up here. Naruto explained. All the while Ghidorah was trying to register what he had just heard. He remembers that he was traveling at high speeds through the galaxy before he was attacked, but after that he was adrift in space, trying to let his wounds heal. Something wasn't right, and Ghidorah knew that a something as simple as wish was not behind the reasoning of him being placed within Naruto's body. There are no such things as wishes kid best to remember that. Ghidorah stated before getting a glare from Naruto. This kid is really pushing his luck now isn't he? Okay Mr. Know-it-all then how do you explain how you ended up inside me when the wish I made was to make me stronger? Naruto demanded to which Ghidorah was starting to see that the idiocy that he is being subjected to. There is no such things as wishes. Ghidorah roared making Naruto nearly jump out of his skin. You weaklings are all the same. Praying and wishing that something good will happen if you ask for it, well guess what, you're just wasting your time. There is no higher intelligence out there that just magically grants you wish, no instead it's just a pointless waste of your pitiful hope that I can't stomach seeing. Naruto was slowly realizing that he may have just pressed one of Ghidorah's buttons without realizing it, judging from his reaction. Naruto simply hid behind a rock as he noticed Ghidorah thrash about while still yelling the same thing. Talk about anger issues. Is in denial or something. Naruto wondered before noticing that one of Ghidorah's tails was heading his way forcing him to run away from his hiding spot. Hey, calm your scully butt down already. Naruto yelled towards Ghidorah in hopes that he would hear him. Ghidorah did hear it and turned to look at him, although Naruto wished that he hadn't because he was looking into the eyes of death itself. You. Ghidorah hissed making Naruto quiver where he stood. Me? Naruto repeated with fear emanating from his voice. What gives you the right to wish and hope for something pleasant to happen to you? Ghidorah demanded making Naruto stop his shaking as he listened to what Ghidorah was saying. You don't deserve to wish and hope, I bet you were greatly loved and adored by your parents. Spoiled and loved by those around you and told that you were special. In the real world kid special won't save your life when someone or something comes to take it, so don't even think that you are worthy enough to make a wish when you're nothing more than an insignificant little brat. Naruto didn't respond at all, but instead simply downcasted his gaze from Ghidorah making said dragon snort. He had listened to what Ghidorah had stated, but all those descriptions were not accurate, contrary to what Ghidorah thought. What makes you think I've had a pleasant life? Naruto asked not looking up at Ghidorah who had released a low bellow. My life has been everything but that. Naruto's exclamation surprised Ghidorah as he was watching this child who had the audacity to yell at him. So, what joined the club? How many lives do you think I earned? It's called life, and it will cheat you out mostly everything. Ghidorah bluntly stated. I had my parents taken from me at birth, Naruto began much to Ghidorah's displeasure. I've been raised by my godparents yes, but they are hardly available at times. I left the compound to start becoming independent yes, but the loneliness was too great. The villagers are nice, but that is out of pity and respect for my parents, they don't see me as me. Kids I try to become friends with are afraid for some reason, because a rumor came out that people died around me. Now I am here and you're telling me that I have been spoiled and loved by everyone, that I have parents, that I've been called special. I've never been called special in my entire life because I have no talent. 
The door was still getting irked that Naruto was yelling at him. He wasn't going to believe these words that were being thrown at him until he saw Naruto's eyes glaring at him with every bit of emotion, expressing that he was telling the truth. Ghidorah didn't want to care what the boy's life was like, but Naruto was still yelling at him. You are the one who doesn't deserve to have wishes or hope. Naruto exclaimed at Ghidorah surprising the dragon. You've said you've conquered and destroyed planets. You're the only one here not worthy of anything. Naruto had to catch his breath as he was physical drained from all of that yelling, which came to him as a surprise. Ghidorah though remained silent as he eyed Naruto as though waiting to see if he was done. Is that it, or should I keep my ears covered while you yell your useless banter? Ghidorah asked rather bland as he saw Naruto nod his head. I'll say this, you've got balls to yell at me like that, which in your case is good news for you. Naruto picked up his head and looked at the dragon in confusion, although he was still trying to catch his breath and was unable to ask a question. Basically, Brad I'm saying that since you have a drive to give me, a kaiju that destroyed civilizations and is known as the planet killer, a piece of your mind then I guess that you're not entirely spineless. Is that supposed to be a compliment? Naruto asked after finally catching his breath. You can take as you like, but that will be all that you're getting from me. Ghidorah retorted. Besides you're going to need that resolve if you're going to survive outside your home. I know that and that's why I want you to help me get stronger. Naruto restated his earlier statement. Ghidorah merely scoffed as he flew up into the air above Naruto. Brad if you think that I'm just going to train you then you have another thing coming. Ghidorah countered. What? Naruto yelled out in shock. What do you mean you're not going to train me? I showed you my resolve, didn't I? That was all that you've shown me. You're still weak in my eyes, and until you've proven that you've gotten stronger you will never be trained by me. Ghidorah had stated before flying away into the recesses of Naruto's mind, leaving him there to think of what had just happened. Naruto was utterly displeased as he was left standing in his mindscape alone without anyone else there. A lonely barren rock floating in a dark space with no signs of life anywhere. I see that this place reflects my life pretty well. Naruto stated before turning to leave only to realize something. Wait, how do I get out of here? A couple hours had passed, and Naruto was slowly opening his eyes. His gaze was met with bright lights coming from the ceiling above him. Naruto recognized the place almost instantly and decided to sit up, only when he did he noticed that he couldn't. Allowing for his eyes to adjust Naruto realized that he was restrained and that he had an IV in his arm. What happened, all I remember was that jerk of a dragon leaving and I couldn't get out. Naruto had wondered what was going on until the door to his room opened and Shizun walked in and closed the door behind her. Shizun? Naruto asked trying to get her attention. It worked because she instantly turned around and was surprised to see that Naruto was conscious for some reason. And Naruto are you awake she stuttered as she rushed over to see that he was. Wait here I'll be right back. She then rushed outside the door, leaving Naruto to think why she said wait when he was stuck there unable to move. He slowly pushed that thought out of his mind as he tried to think about his current situation. Huh, maybe she was surprised because I had that shooting star hit me on top of the Hokage monument. Naruto thought before he heard three pairs of footsteps coming down the hall towards his room. Looking over at the door Naruto watched as Shizun returned with Tsunade and Jiraiya. Naruto, I see that you're conscious now. Tsunade stated as she enters doctor mode, that's Naruto called it whenever she would check on people, even him and Shizun, she carried herself professionally, only with her work. Yeah, but what happened? Naruto asked her. Tsunade seemed hesitant to answer, and it was Jiraiya who would answer his question. Naruto, you had a decent-sized meteor fall on you that carried you outside the village as it kept going. When we realized that you were underneath it, our worst fears were slowly beginning to emerge as we managed to remove it off you thanks to several volunteers. Jiraiya explained. We had original thought you were dead, but when they removed the meteor it was revealed that you were almost completely unscathed. Naruto was surprised before he realized that he didn't feel any pain or stiffness when he first woke up. After checking you over I noticed that your eyes had changed color to a dark red hue, which made think at first that there was internal bleeding, but that was not the case. Tsunade explained. Your entire body was unaffected by the sheer force that was delivered by the meteor, and yet when I placed the IV in your arm, there was nothing to suggest that your body would have come out relatively unscathed. What we're saying Naruto is that for some reason you survived something that no one should have been able to survive, especially at your age. Jiraiya stated making Naruto quickly guess the reason why he was still alive. Naruto, did you see anything before you fell unconscious? I saw the three stars in my orb before making my wish. Naruto stated surprising the three others in the room, considering that no one has seen three stars in hundreds of years. Then after that I saw a bright light, and that was all I remember. Naruto had specifically left out the part where his third star that allowed him to make his wish was the one that crashed into him, because then he would be forced to answer questions about said wish. When you saw that bright light did you feel some sort of power within yourself building up? 
Jiraiya asked confusing Naruto. Like an extension of yourself was coming out of your body. Naruto didn't understand what he was saying, and Jiraiya saw this. Naruto did you try and use your chakra at all when you saw the bright light? Tsunade asked making her question much easier to answer. Not really, I hadn't even thought about doing that while I was standing up there. Naruto answered honestly, this seemed to have stopped them from asking any further questions about if it was anything on his part. Then perhaps you got really lucky like a guardian angel was watching out for you. Jiraiya suggested only to make Naruto think about what more than likely saved him was far from being an angel. Inside the recesses of Naruto's mind Ghidorah let out a loud and thundering sneeze. Why do I have a feeling that boy is thinking about me right now? Ghidorah thought before continuing to fly around Naruto's mind. Back in the hospital, Naruto was getting checked over Tsunade again, just to be sure that he was fine before he could go. Now then Naruto, if anyone asks why your eyes are red instead of blue, just explain to them that you were in an accident and that this was a result of it. Tsunade informed him. I gotcha bachan. Naruto stated causing Tsunade to grow a tick mark on her forehead. What did I say about calling me that? Tsunade asked him to cause Naruto to smirk at her much to her confusion. That I can call you that whenever I wanted to, and that Iro Sanin is going to go and peek on the women's bath today around noon. Naruto stated causing Tsunade to change her appearance with a calm look on her face, as she finished up Naruto before proceeding to get up and leave the room. Naruto, Tsunade started as she stopped in front of the door. Don't ever let me catch you doing what that idiot does, understood. Naruto nodded his head before watching Tsunade walk out of the room and proceed to head over to deal with Jiraiya. Looking over at the clock Naruto realized that Tsunade had done all his treatments on her break and felt a little bad for telling her what Jiraiya was doing. Ever since the Naruto could remember both his godparents were tasked with a large amount of work. Tsunade oversaw the hospital here in Kanoha as head doctor, while Jiraiya was busy managing the spy network he set up around the elemental nations. Both were hardly given any breaks and would sometimes be gone for long periods of time, which really left Naruto with Shizun, although if Tsunade had to leave the village she had to go to. Aside from the men a couple others there was only three people in the village that Naruto got to see almost every day, the Hokage and the Ichirikas. He hadn't visited them that much in the past week, mainly because of all the work he had to do because of his last prank. Next time I'll make sure not to pull a prank around another festival. Naruto mumbled to himself as he got the rest of his things before heading outside of his room to exit the hospital. Along the way he saw Shizun being busy helping Tsunade by doing a lot of paperwork. Naruto decided to keep going mainly so that he didn't interrupt her. Reaching the stairs Naruto was nearly knocked down when the door leading to the stairs opened. The person who opened the door quickly realized that she had almost hit somebody and was quick to see if they were okay. I'm so sorry for not seeing you there are you okay? A feminine voice asked. Naruto looked up and almost instantly recognized the person. It's fine, although I'm surprised to see you being so careless Rin on Chan. Naruto jokingly stated as the young woman in front of him quickly realized who it was in front of her. Naruto what are you doing here? You know you shouldn't bother too many people here it is a hospital after all. Rin told him. Naruto was surprised that she hadn't been informed that he was brought in during the night, although it was not told everyone, so Naruto just didn't bring it up. I was just informing Bachan about what the Irosanin was up to was all. Naruto chuckled with his infamous grin on his face. Rin wasn't happy to hear that he was meddling with people again and was about to give him a stern talk when she recognized Naruto's eyes. Naruto what happened to your eyes? She asked him to cause Naruto to sigh as he realized that she would have found out eventually. I got into a little accident last night during the festival and the result was my eyes changing colors. Naruto explained. Are you okay? Is there anything else wrong with you? Rin began asking questions trying to see if he was truly alright. I'm fine, just trying to make up a cool excuse to explain it to everyone at the academy tomorrow is all. Naruto grinned. But I have to go so I'll catch you later on Rin Nichan. With that Naruto began making his way out of the hospital, and with it a remark from Rin expressing to not run in a hospital. Meanwhile a meeting was beginning amongst the heads of the village. Saratobi Hiruzen was leading the meeting with the others consisting of Danzo, Hamura, and Kaharu. Jiraiya and Tsunade won't be able to make it to this meeting today, as both are extremely busy at the moment. Saratobi explained to the others. Their students are quite the busy bees aren't they Saratobi? Kaharu commented. The busy focusing on minuscule tasks instead of the bigger picture if you ask me. Danzo stated gruffly. Jiraiya is currently locating a suitable candidate at the moment, and Tsunade is busy managing the hospital and new applicants. Saratobi stated making Danzo change his opinion. Has he found anyone at the moment? Hamura asked. Saratobi wasn't going to lie, he informed them now they haven't found anybody yet. Time is running out Saratobi, you know that. I am fully aware of how long the container can hold the fox, that is why I have issued the task to Jiraiya. 
Saratobi stated as he went through different documentation that was provided by Jiraiya. The fool might still have his antics, but he gets serious when he needs to be. Saratobi then handed the three each a copy of the documents that Jiraiya handed over to him. So, there is no eligible candidate in the land of fire. Kahara remarked. This is becoming trifling. Then perhaps we should look outside of the land of fire, there have been known survivors that have traveled across the elemental nations beforehand. Hamura commented. The problem is though we can't just kidnap them, it could lead to a diplomatic incident, and without a Jinchuriki we can't afford to be so careless. Saratobi responded. It's a shame that the boy can't be the Jinchuriki. Danzo stated blandly causing him to receive a couple looks from the other occupants of the room. He is half Uzumaki, but that fool who took control of the Kaiubi, stopped that from happening. We do not talk about that here Danzo. Saratobi warned. The boy is no use to us anyway, just another civilian whose parents were famous. There's no need to go after him. Danzo added before returning to the documents. Has he tried locating anyone outside of the land of fire? Danzo decided to change the topic mainly because he wanted to avoid annoying Saratobi around this time. He's starting to at this very moment, which is why he said he was going to be late. Saratobi stated. Let's hope he finds someone soon, otherwise this get very dangerous. Hamura expressed his concern with the others nodding as they had felt the same. If worse comes to worse Iratobi, the situation could become desperate are you okay with that? Kaharu asked her old teammate. Saratobi didn't want to think about that possibility, although he knew that he would have to take it into consideration. And so, Saratobi started getting the attention of his rival. If it comes down to it, see to it that no one will learn of our actions. Danzo nodded as he took this just as seriously as the others. Glad to see that you are back Saratobi, maybe now one can make some progress. Danzo thought as he was careful not to reveal his thoughts and continued looking over the documents when he spotted something. Saratobi, there is a mentioning that Jureya had taught in Yuzumaki in this document. The third Hokage looked for the part Danzo was referring to and saw it almost as clear as day. When cross-referencing and thinking back to around that time Saratobi remembered the information. Yes, it was quite some time ago, back when he, Tsunade, and Arachimaru had planned on retuning to village after their fight with Hanzo. Saratobi explained. Jureya had taught the young man along with his two friends, although from what information Jureya found out, they were all killed over a name. Danzo inwardly cursed his own foolishness back when he assisted Danzo, as he remembered seeing a red-haired boy long ago. I guess that in the future I must be extra careful with those I have killed off. Danzo thought. Saratobi noticed the inner conflict of his rival and took note of it for the future. It still wouldn't help us if the young man had survived. We need someone with still developing chakra coils and preferably an Uzumaki. Hamura addressed with the others stifling through the papers analyzing all the details. I'll have Jureya keep looking, however, it might become unlikely that we can get an Uzumaki, and if so then we must select individuals with growing chakra coils. Saratobi informed them. So, you're saying that we must pre-select individuals beforehand. Honestly, I would hate to give anyone this burden any soul for the benefit of the village, but this is essential. Kaharu stated. We have a couple months to find a suitable host, otherwise the Kaiubi will break free. Saratobi expressed as he and the others continue to plan for the best and worst case scenarios that could happen within the next few months. Following his trip from the hospital Naruto had gone home and rested for today, which was the day the academy was picking back up. He wasn't particularly fond of going today, but he had to go if he wanted to become a shinobi. He sat down ready to eat some breakfast when he noticed something odd. Whenever he went to go and turn off on the lights he would get shocked for some reason. The same thing happened with the electronics he touched, it became rather annoying making Naruto question what was going on before casting it aside as nothing but a bad morning. Eventually he made it out of his apartment and headed over towards the academy, along the way he noticed that a couple people were looking at him. This was new, he was never the center of this much attention before, unless he had just done a prank, but he was clean of pranks this past week. Naruto then remembered that his eyes were a different color, so he figured it was just that. Sure enough once he got to the academy his thoughts were confirmed. At first when he walked in nobody paid him much mind, however, after they noticed his eyes were a different color that became a different story. Whoa, look at Naruto, his eyes are different. Someone pointed out making Naruto shrink in his chair. Hey what's wrong Naruto tired of the color blue? Kiba remarked much to his annoyance. If you must know, I got into an accident the other day during the festival that resulted in my eyes color changing. Naruto stated hoping that would be enough for them. Kiba on the other hand just kept pecking at him. What did you do spill a drink in your eyes or something, I mean you pretty much suck, so I wouldn't put it past you. Kiba laughed. 
Naruto didn't like Kiba for a lot of reasons, but some of the main reasons was because he picked on him, because he just couldn't mold or use chakra that well for some reason, which resulted in him becoming dead last in a lot of areas. Kiba wasn't that much better, but he probably figured he could get away with bullying Naruto and not worry about any repercussions. There were many times Naruto just wanted to punch Kiba in the face, but he would remind himself that it was best to not cause a fight. However, this was one of those times when Naruto didn't want to be bothered and Kiba was beginning to push his buttons. One wrong word could set off Naruto, much to the amusement of his new occupant. Hidora had been watching the whole scene transpire and was curious as to how far his vessel would go if he was in a fight. This will get interesting, especially since the kid got something from me when I was placed in here. Ghidorah chuckled. This was his only form of entertainment and was going to try and make the best of it by stimulating Naruto's aggressive emotions as much as possible. Kiba then noticed something was odd with Akamaru, his small dog that was residing on his head. Normally Akamaru would be enjoying his time with Kiba, however, Akamaru seemed unnerved near Naruto. It was to the point that Akamaru had silently whimpered as though trying to tell Kiba something. What's wrong with Akamaru he's never like this. Kiba was a little worried for his animal companion and then sniffed the air around Naruto. Something is wrong, his scent is now completely different. Now it smells like a combination of a fire and a storm around him. Kiba was about to say something until Aruka came in and demanded that everyone take their seats. This meant that Ghidorah would not see how much Naruto could take until he'd snap much to the dragon's disapproval. So close, yet so far away. Ghidorah stated as he flew up to a mountaintop to rest. Time for a nap then, because I sure as hell am not going to watch any of this for over an hour. Naruto felt a little relief knowing that class was going to start, however, he still didn't like the fact that Kiba bothered him about his eyes. If anything, he should have left him alone after he was given the explanation. Looking over towards the window Naruto noticed that Sasuke, the class genius, was looking outside the window again. He didn't blame him considering how boring these stupid these lessons were. Instead Naruto's thoughts were elsewhere, he didn't pay much attention in class anyway, because Jiraiya and Tsunade taught him much of the material that the academy would go over, it was just utilizing his chakra was the biggest problem he had. Both Jiraiya and Tsune tried to fix his problem, but what they suggested never worked that well. He had until the end of next year to learn to utilize his chakra, otherwise he might not be allowed to become a shinobi. The thought was daunting on Naruto and was especially worried about the following year. Redirecting his attention back to the class Naruto found himself staring down one of the most complicated and boring topics he ever thought possible, Fuinjutsu. Who in the right mind would even try to understand something as stupid and complicated? Naruto thought oblivious to his own roots. I really hope that I'll never have to use that in the future, otherwise I'm screwed. After a brief discussion on Fuinjutsu it was lunch time and the class headed outside to eat. Naturally it was at that time that everyone broke off into different groups as to eat with each other. This however did not include Naruto as he was forced to eat alone, something that began not long after the rumor started. There were times that someone would come up to him, but that was either for informing him of class changes or if it was Kiba and his group. They hadn't bothered him today because they were busy showing off each other with what they had to eat, while Naruto just ate on the single swing by himself. He knew that he wasn't the only loner out here, but the one thing that separated him from them was that they wanted to be alone. Sasuke was one such example, Naruto didn't even see why people liked him, his attitude and demeanor was ice cold, and those that he would talk to was only out of respect or of an absolute necessity. He tried talking to him once, but his fangirls kept him at bay and prevented any form of contact between the two. This of course led to Naruto slowly growing a grudge and becoming jealous of the prodigy Ichiha. Where many people saw Sasuke as a gifted and loyal Ichiha, Naruto saw an arrogant and self-centered idiot that he wanted to overcome. One day I'll surpass him, and then everyone will realize that I am the one who deserves the attention. Naruto continued eating as he knew that they didn't have too long to eat because they were going to have combat training next and the teachers wanted to make sure that they didn't eat too much and get sick. If they didn't want us to get sick, then they should have held off until the end of class today, oh wait, it is the last thing today. Looking over at the group of fangirls around his now declared rival with great animosity. Feeling like someone was staring at him, Sasuke looked over and he thought he saw Naruto looking at him, but saw that he was staring at his food while eating. The announcement to come back inside was quick and everyone began cleaning up and heading over to where they would be conducting the training. This was the one thing new he had a chance at excelling in because aside from the lack of being able to use chakra as efficiently, he was trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Even then it wasn't as outstanding as some of the clan children who had their clan teach them techniques that would make them efficient on the battlefield. Half of the stuff that Jiraiya and Tsunade wanted to teach Naruto couldn't be applied because they require significant chakra control, which he lacked in. This however didn't stop him from training every day. 
He had heard the stories of a student who was his senior who excelled without using jutsu. Iruka and Mizuki were in front of the crowd of students addressing the rules and the order in which they would be fighting. Naruto noticed that they mainly focused on pitting the clan head children against non-clan children to keep their grades relative. For the most part it was Mizuki, Iruka was busy watching over the students who were combating each other to notice the difference. Approaching Mizuki he noticed a faint glimmer of disdain, he could only guess why. Kiba was in all intents purposes Mizuki's favorite for some reason which led Naruto to only guess who he was going to be paired up against. Sure, enough his thoughts were confirmed when he was told his match was going to be with Kiba. Naruto silently seethed as he was tired of being paired up against him and losing, only to be humiliated. Time flew rather slow as the inevitable event drew closer, and it didn't help that people were already whispering how Kiba was going to clobber him. It angered him much to his own pride. He hardly even felt remotely this much disdain over a single person before, not even Sasu kirked him as much as Kiba. The door felt the negativity within his vessel rising and decided to see what he missed. Noticing how trivial the matter really was he was curious if he finally had a chance to push Naruto into releasing all his hatred in the fight. A dark grin situated on each of Ghidorah's jaws as he situated himself into an upright position and began focusing his energy. Yes, what an ample opportunity to see the extent this brat will reach to crush someone he utterly despises. Ghidorah chuckled as charged up his electricity to send off for his vessel's use, however, the energy wasn't being transmitted much to Ghidorah's own displeasure. My power is being stopped by some internal problem, I must eliminate it if I want to see a great show. Ghidorah took off in search of the source that the problem was originating. Naruto's match was next, and he was starting to sweat a little. He wasn't looking forward to it, and he knew that it was mandatory, not saying that he wouldn't participate considering he did have pride. The thought of losing to Kiba again was eating away at him, and he was becoming frustrated. Hey Naruto, you better just give up otherwise you're going to get your butt handed to you. A random student told him. I don't know why he's even trying, he can't even use chakra. A girl asked a friend not caring if she could be heard. Maybe he's just too stupid to give up. A random guy in his class jokingly answered causing those around him to laugh. Naruto clenched his fists together trying to ignore them, but they were not considering his own feelings at all. Others watching this playthrough knew better than to get involved or just didn't care enough, which was the majority. Time came when the match before his ended and Aruka called him and Kiba up to begin their sparring. Naruto took to Aruka's left while Kiba took his right. Both starred each other in the eyes which made Kiba grin. I don't know why you just call it quits, perhaps you're just a glutton for punishment. Kiba boasted before Aruka corrected him and told him to cease harassing Naruto. Aruka had known that Naruto and Kiba were not on the best terms, and yet they seemed to always be paired up together. Perhaps I need to talk with Mizuki about this reoccurring problem. Aruka thought before addressing the rules to the two. Alright listen up you two as I stated earlier, the first one to make contact on the other individual three times wins the match, you cannot use ninjutsu or jinjutsu just a jutsu, now are you ready? Looking at the two Aruka confirmed that both were ready before initiating the spar with a loud hajim dot. Rushing forward to throw off Kiba, Naruto swung his right fist towards Kiba's chest, only for him to dodge to the side. Allowing for Naruto to pass him Kiba took this advantage, and with Akamaru they counter-attacked. The two may have been an inseparable pair, but Akamaru was still wary about fighting Naruto, which surprised some of the onlookers as well as Kiba. Come on Akamaru let's beat Naruto like usual. Kiba attempted as he tried to sway his dog to join him in the fight, yet Akamaru was shaking a bit. This infuriated Kiba who thought Naruto had done something to his dog. Hey. What did you do to Akamaru? Naruto used the situation to get back a few feet before answering. I don't know what's wrong with your stupid dog. Perhaps he just knows that you can't beat me. Naruto stated. If Kiba wasn't already mad then he was furious. Taking his family's stance, he proceeds to charge at Naruto with every intent to beat him to a pulp, something not overlooked at by Aruka. He was starting to think that he should stop the match, but Mizuki had appeared to stop him from doing so. There is no need Aruka, Naruto is a good dodger, he'll be careful to avoid Kiba, but he lacks in the strength to hit him. He stated. That's why you paired them Aruka responded flabbergasted, which Mizuki quickly interjected. I was simply pairing up the lower scores and they were close enough. The rest of the students had already been paired up, so I paired the two together to complete the exercise. Mizuki explained as he tried to weasel his way out of the situation. After today Mizuki you had better watch it, otherwise I'll report you to the Hokage directly, do I make myself clear? Haruka whispered trying not to be too loud for the students to hear. Mizuki nodded as he knew better than to go against the Hokage. Naruto continued to dodge Kiba's attacks, yet he has been unable to land a single blow on Kiba as well. It irritated him to no end that he had been successful in all but landing a blow. Having large amounts of stamina made it easier for him to continue with his charade that seemed to be lasting for quite a while. 
Kibodo was finally beginning to snap and lunged at Naruto in such a way that forced Naruto into a corner, allowing him to strike the first blow. It was across Naruto's left shoulder, and it made him fall onto the ground by sheer force. Come on and get up Naruto. Kiba exclaimed as he waited for Naruto to get up only to charge again and this time hitting him in the chest, sending him back a couple feet scoring another point, although by this point, Iruka had seen enough. Alright Kiba that is enough. Iruka exclaimed causing the student to look at his sensei, as the match seemed to be put on hold, unless Iruka was going to end it. But sensei, he did something to Akamaru. Kiba protested. And I'm getting back at him for doing it. That is enough. Naruto has done nothing to Akamaru, honestly what makes you think he even did anything Iruka demanded. Akamaru is afraid of him for some reason, his eye color is different from the last time, and he even smells different. He's a freak. Kiba exclaimed. Those words repeated in Naruto's mind repeatedly, causing him to seethe. His anger and resentment were growing to unthinkable levels that no child should reach at this point in their life. Of course, Naruto wasn't a normal child, which he knew, but even still it was nearly incomprehensible for many to think of such things. Clenching his fists again Naruto attempted to get up, but some reason he was having difficulty. At the same time Ghidorah has been scouring across the expanses of Naruto's mind in search of the blockage, until he noticed something off in one location. Heading down to look at the strange formation, Ghidorah presumed that this was the cause of the blockage. This must be it, whatever it is it looks like a form of writing. Ghidorah had estimated as he looked in closer detail. Now then, you have been the reason why I haven't been able to enjoy a great show, so that means that you have to go. Ghidorah focused a large amount of energy as he prepared to destroy whatever it was that was in front of him. The writing, like a seal, was going to be destroyed, and with it, Ghidorah will be able to influence Naruto even more. The energy concentrated from his wings as it traveled up to each individual head. The power that has been used to destroy civilizations and even small planets, was about to be used once again. Once fully charged Ghidorah unleashed the concentrated energy onto the seal, in the form of powerful gravity beams that obliterated it from the mindscape in a single blow. The result was a massive explosion within Naruto's mind, and a painful headache for Naruto who cringed and grasped his head out in pain. Unaware of what he had just done Ghidorah turned back to observe what was transpiring when he felt an increase in power amongst his vessel's body. Was that a form of restraint? Ghidorah wondered before returning to the scene before him of Naruto on the ground. If so, then I will say that this will become very entertaining. Ghidorah was chuckling as he watched Naruto lift himself up from the ground. Naruto got to his feet and had his eyes darkened. Kiba noticed that he was back up and was prepared to finish the fight. I don't care if I get in trouble, anyone who messes with my dog is going to get their ass handed to them. Kiba yelled as he charged forward against Aruka's instructions. Getting closer Kiba pulled back his fist and many thoughts that this would be it for Naruto, as they all knew how their fights usually ended. That was what they presumed at first before Naruto erupted with flowing chakra surrounding him and sending sparks and electricity flying from his body, startling everyone and causing Kiba to stop dead in his tracks. Everyone was taken back as they watched the chakra, which was gold, strike out at anything and everything around him. You said that Akamaru was afraid of me, you do remember what I said earlier right? Naruto asked Kiba as he clenched his own fist and pulled back. Lighting enveloped the appendage lighting it up in a golden white light. This time Kiba, I'm going to win. Kiba was horrified as he looked at Naruto who stared at him with a look that sent out mass terror to those who saw it. Unable to move Kiba found himself stuck as Naruto prepared to strike. Once the fist started swinging Aruka managed to appear before it escalated into a much more severe incident and redirected Naruto's arm away from Kiba. When he did so the lightning shot off Naruto's arm and through the academy wall and a couple buildings. As the bolt was fired Naruto had realized what had just happened and proceeded to calm down, the result was him beginning to lose consciousness. Naruto then proceeded to pass out fully from exhaustion and Aruka had to take him to the nurse's office, while Mizuki, who was shocked by what he had just seen ended class for today. Kiba was checked out too before being taken inside for Aruka to talk to him before getting the boy's mother. Adora though was impressed at the amount of killing intent Naruto had at that moment and couldn't help but sneer. However, he had accidentally altered Naruto's normal chakra when he broke the seal, causing his power to enhance Naruto's chakra. It may have been unintentional, but I will say that it was sure entertaining. This brat might just give me a good enough show if he's lucky. Adora laughed before flying up into the air to fly around Naruto's mindscape once again. Waking up in a nursing room for the second time this week Naruto felt groggy. His body was tingling, for what reason he could not understand why, and tried to get up only for the nurse to keep him down. Careful there Naruto, you're experiencing chakra exhaustion, something that is quite a serious issue for normal shinobi. The nurse stated. Naruto was confused as his mind was still clouded on what had caused him to end up there. 
What do you mean by chakra exhaustion? I haven't been able to manipulate a single drop of chakra before. Naruto asked the nurse who busy checking him over. Yes, we are fully aware of that, but it seems as though your chakra was lying dormant for some reason and that it awoke during your spar with a young Inuzuka boy. The nurse explained as Naruto finally began recalling the prior events of him and the spar and feeling anger and spite towards Kiba, as well as him charging at him before being intercepted by Aruka. Is he okay? Naruto asked the nurse, who was a little surprised considering she heard that Kiba was the bully in the situation. He's perfectly fine, although your sensei Aruka got in touch with his mother and informed her of the situation, so he's not out of the doghouse yet so to speak. The nurse chuckled at the way she phrased the last part. He also informed your guardians about the issue and they are on their way here as we speak. Hum again? Naruto asked for clarification. Did you say both and not Shizun? Yes, that is right, your sensei made sure that both would show up and for good reason I'd say. The nurse clarified. Naruto though was terrified at the fact that both were coming. Normally it would be Shizun who would show up as to be the medium between the academy and Tsunade, since Jiraiya was gone for certain lengths of time on occasion. The fact that both are showing up meant that this was going to become something not short of being a large issue. No sooner had those thoughts graced his mind, Naruto heard the familiar pair of footsteps coming down the hall. Terror slowly began to build up as Naruto tried to figure out if he was in the right or not concerning the incident with the spar. He was merely defending himself for the most part, although he did try to bash in Kiba's face in the end, still though he shouldn't get into trouble for that, right? All these thoughts were plaguing his mind before finally the pair of familiar footsteps stopped at the door to the nurse's office. There was a knock and the nurse told them that they may enter, this in turn led to the door opening, revealing both Jureya and Tsunade. Both of their faces bearing a serious expression which made Naruto the more nervous. The nurse though was calm as can be as she finished writing something down before facing Naruto's godparents. Hello Lady Tsunade, Lord Jureya, I think that both of you will be glad to know that Naruto is only suffering from chakra exhaustion at the moment, however, he will need to rest for the remainder of the day if he is to be able to attend class again in two days. The nurse informed them. Both of his godparents were shocked at the mention of Naruto suffering from chakra exhaustion. Wait, I didn't quite hear you right, did you say chakra exhaustion? Jureya asked to which the nurse nodded in confirmation. It's quite understandable that this would be surprising, considering that young Naruto here hasn't been successful at even getting a drop of chakra to manifest beforehand. The nurse stated. It was quite a surprise for everyone here at the academy as well, considering that the fourth Hokage's son, who prior to today was unable to manifest chakra, finally did so during a spar, quite eventful. Would you mind if I checked him myself? Tsunade asked the nurse who nodded and moved out of Tsunade's way. Making her way over to Naruto, Tsunade began checking him over and within a few moments, she came to the exact same conclusion as the nurse and couldn't help but smile. Well it seems you're a bit of a late bloomer. Naruto seemed to relax at this point and chuckled sheepishly. How exactly did this come to pass? Jureya asked the nurse, who then proceeded to pull out the account written by Aruka. During a sparring match with Kiba in Yuzuka Naruto was pushed incredibly much to his sensei's distaste and was about to end the match before more harm could come, however, before he could end it, Naruto had managed to unlock his chakra so to speak, which manifested for all to see. The nurse summarized before handing over the account to Jiraiya. That is the full detailed report that I just summarized, it contains all the information for you to look over. Jiraiya proceeded to take the account from the nurse and look it over, much of it surprised him, although a lot of it he didn't particularly liked. Thank you, and do you know where the other sensei, Mizuki is? Jiraiya asked. He has been sent home on suspension for the time being for his actions, and there is investigation into possibly other actions he took along those same lines while Aruka wasn't around. The nurse mentioned. For the time being though Naruto is allowed to return home and rest for the remainder of the day. Thank you, both Jiraiya and Tsune thanked as Jiraiya picked up Naruto, and they made their way over to the Senju compound. Huh, I thought I was allowed to go home. Naruto asked as he was slowly succumbing to the desire to sleep. You're staying at the compound tonight that way we can make sure that you're alright, and besides, we'll need to check you tomorrow anyway. Tsunade stated before Naruto fell into slumber. And there's another reason why. Takra exhaustion can be pretty dangerous, although I'm surprised at the fact that he even regained consciousness. Jiraiya stated as they made their way out of the academy building. Yuzumakis usually have large pools of chakra, and it takes a lot for one to suffer chakra exhaustion. When I was checking him over I noticed that his chakra pool was steadily increasing in size, I believe that due to being dormant for so long, has caused its surface at slow pace. Tsunade stated. That would explain the chakra exhaustion he is currently experiencing. Perhaps, but for now let's get back to compound first and then head over to Sensei, he'll want to know about this. Jurei replied as they continued onwards to the compound. This might be a blessing in disguise. 
if you're thinking about suggesting putting that fox inside of him, then you're obviously not considering his own well-being, remember what happened to the previous host. Tsunade retorted. I'm fully aware of that, however we must consider it to be an option in case we don't find someone else, and preferably after his chakra coils become more stable now that they have chakra flowing through them. Jureya explained as they continued their way to the Senju compound where they would drop off Naruto and then head directly to meet their sensei, the third Hokage. Arriving at their sensei's office Tsunade and Jureya entered without knocking as they were already expected. Looking up from the papers on his desk the third Hokage Saratobi Hiruzen was about to have a conversation that would change the future of the entire village. Tsunade, Jureya, come it's time that we talk. Hiruzen motioned them over towards his desk. Sorry we're a little late sensei, we had to take care of something involving Naruto. Jureya explained causing his sensei to raise a brow. Oh, did he get into trouble again? The third Hokage as he moved some documents around his desk so that he could put his elbows on the desk without crippling any of them. No, in fact something else happened during a spar with one of his fellow students at the academy. Jureya started. I see, I take it that he got injured. He asked his students as he wanted to make sure that Naruto was alright. Far from it, Naruto has awakened his chakra. Jureya gleamed surprising the old cage who couldn't help but smile. That is excellent news, I remember how hard it was for him up until now, so is he well. Hiruzen asked with excitement glimmering in his old eyes. He is currently suffering from low chakra exhaustion as a result from his spar, Tsunade began a short explanation. I left Shizun to monitor him, it appears that his chakra is slowly beginning to form the essence of his chakra pool, however, his tenketsu are having a difficult time accustoming to something that wasn't normally there for 11 years. I see, I do hope to see him walking around as good as new soon, that boy has endured enough as it is. Here is instated before shifting through some of the assorted documents. This is great news to hear, however we must begin discussing about the Kaiubi issue. Soon the Anbu in the room placed up an invisible barrier preventing anyone from outside the room from listening in on their conversation. With Naruto finally able to have chakra flowing through his body now properly, and with a little time he could become the next Jinchuriki. Jureya suggested much to Tsunade's disapproval. Jureya. You can't expect his body to become accustomed to something that has just surfaced. Tsunade scolded him. Naruto needs time to get used to his chakra, and there is no way he can get accustomed to it by the time we need a Jinchuriki in barely three months. Tsunade, what would you want us to do if we can't find another person to become the Kaiubi's Jinchuriki Jureya questioned her. Will we just sit back and allow the Kaiubi to break free of its temporary prison and destroy Konoha? I'm saying what needs to be heard when regarding Naruto's Tsunade began before their sensei, the third Hokage took over the conversation. There will be no need for him to become a Jinchuriki now. Hiruzen interrupted the two causing both to focus their attention back onto their sensei. Good, now it seems that I have your attention again. Sensei, are you saying that you found a possible candidate? Jureya asked as his sensei handed him a report for him to look at. It was a spy report on a young girl around Naruto's age with red hair and eyes who was currently a resident of Kusagakur. I have a couple teams already en route to the location where she is being kept. Here is in mention surprising the two even more while he inhaled the smoke from his tobacco pipe before finally releasing it to deal with his old nerves. The party left early yesterday evening after the meeting with the other elders. Sensei, how do you know if she is viable enough to already launch a capture mission? For all we know she might not be able to become a Jinchuriki. Jureya expressed as he wasn't fully convinced about his sensei's decision. Aside from that you're willing to send a team into Kusagakur, they may prefer diplomacy, but their policies are harsh. There is no need to worry about Kusa, I sent a message with a team to give to the village head that should convince them of handing her over. The third Hokage stated as he pulled out another paper to hand to his students to look at. Besides I believe it would be in the girl's best interest considering the information we obtained about her, and as for her being a viable candidate, she has the blood of the Yuzumaki running through her veins, much like another Yuzumaki did before her, which is a good enough reason to proceed with the mission. As they continued reading over the sheet both Tsunade and Jureya couldn't believe what they were reading came from their sensei. Sensei, you're willing to offer that much of our own financial resources in exchange for one girl Jureya gawked. Take this from the someone who gambles often, you're putting a lot on the line here. Tsunade stated although Hiruzen waved it off. 15% is hardly something to worry about, in fact the council and I deduced that the sum was adequate enough. Hiruzen stated. Besides that, there are other contingencies that have been set into place. When did all of this decision making take place? Jureya demanded as he wanted to know why both he and Tsunade were excluded from these discussions. The information was delivered by one of your informants directly to me at the end of the meeting, this entitled the council and I to extend the meeting in order to discuss what you've just learned. Saratobi stated while going back to managing the necessary documents involving the issue. 
but if Kusa demands more than just the 15% increase in trade that you're offering, they aren't exactly known for their understanding. Tsunade asked causing Siratobi to give them a very serious look. The team was handpicked by both me and Danzo, should the need arise they will resort to the next backup plan that has been set for just the occasion. Hiruzen stated as his eyes grew colder. Are you planning to go to war for just one person, Jureya questioned his sensei's judgment. I am prepared to do whatever it takes to protect this village, and should the need arise, I will do what I think what is necessary to carry out such tasks, if it means the village will be safe. Hiruzen stated catching both his students off guard, since their sensei was being deadly serious. As Hokage it is my duty to protect this village just as my predecessors before me. Hiraya and Tsunade wanted to input their own opinions, but they knew that there was no chance that they would have been able to convince their sensei to change his mind. Hiruzen knew that his students didn't approve of his methods, but they needed to be done, and so he let out a small sigh. This responsibility is very heavy on the shoulders of the Hokage you must understand, I am not the only Hokage who has been in this office that has made a tough decision. Hiruzen reasoned. Ureya and Tsune didn't respond, and so Hiruzen motioned to them that they could leave. Upon doing so the two Sanin took their leave and returned to the Senju compound to look after Naruto, at the same time the Anbu released the Jutsu that kept the barrier up. Hiruzen's mind was heavy in thought with much of the details of yesterday's meeting, and today's weighing heavily on the mind. Putting some documents aside for later the third Hokage got up from his seat to look over his village from his office windows. The sun was beginning to set, and some of the stars in the sky were beginning to become visible in the night sky. Senseis, Minato, please continue watching over us during these dark times. Hiruzen prayed to the deceased. Looking over his shoulder at the concealed box that was hidden from both Jureya and Tsunade's view next to his desk, Hiruzen's became even more serious. The box contained black folders that were wrapped together by red bindings with different symbols from many of the varying villages assorted on them. I fear that we will need all the help we can get if we're going to survive, Hiruzen looked back up at the darkening sky with grimace with his eyes taking in the many stars becoming visible. When they come. The following morning came with an unpleasant start for Naruto as he awoke with a freight. Jiraiya had decided to get back at Naruto for a prank that he did to him a couple weeks back by sticking some vinegar into Naruto's nose. This in turn caused Naruto to wake up and demand answers from his godfather. What the hell was that for you stupid Iro Sanin? Naruto demanded while Jiraiya just laughed at Naruto's plight. Consider that payback for what you did to me a couple weeks ago when you stuck onion juice up my nose. Jiraiya pointed out even though Naruto was still fuming. Bye I out and Naruto began before being grabbed by Jiraiya and tossed out into the Senju compound's courtyard before rushing at his godson. At the same time Tsunade and Shizun were busy reading today's newspaper which was just recently delivered. Tantan was resting on Tsunade's lap while the two were conversing on an article about something going on the land of wave. The chat was cut short when Naruto was flung directly at Tsune who proceeded to catch the boy and set him down on the ground. I think that's enough playtime Jiraiya, Naruto seems to be back to normal. Tsune stated. Just making sure, after all we don't want him to get to hurt since today is the day we're going to get him caught up in chakra control and manipulation. Jiraiya replied as he walked over towards Naruto who was still a little dizzy from Jiraiya, flinging him at Tsune. If he was able to move around this morning then that means that he would be able to do such tasks, regardless of making him dodge your attacks. Tsunade pointed out causing Jiraiya to scratch his head sheepishly. With that out of the way Jiraiya turned and faced Naruto, who has regained his senses and balance. Alright Naruto, now remember how we taught you to control your chakra, Jiraiya began as he wanted Naruto to remember those important lessons that were taught to him. We want you to do those exact same exercises right now, so that we can see this chakra. Naruto, nodding and understanding, took a deep breath in before slowly releasing it as he relaxed and began to concentrate on the flow of his chakra. The feeling was of the tingly sort and shot out across Naruto's body. It was heavy as well, but at the same time almost non-existent. Feeling this source of power Naruto began to try and manipulate it by using the methods that he was taught, unknowingly causing it to manifest for his godparents to see. The sudden appearance of the golden chakra surprised them as poor Tauntin was startled half to death and ran for cover behind Shizun, who was also taken by surprise. Hiraya took note of how the chakra sparked out and tore into the ground and surrounding walls, all while Naruto seemingly was unaware of the entire thing. This chakra is extremely dense for just a child such as Naruto to have, something like this could only be expected from a Jinchuriki. Jiraiya noted to himself. Tsunade noticed how calm Naruto truly was and decided to try something. Picking up a single rock, which garnered Jiraiya's eye, she tossed it at high speeds towards Naruto, much to Jiraiya's surprise. Before he could even protest though the chakra struck out against the rock turning it into dust. Just as I thought, nobody could remain that calm with all of that chakra tearing up the place, unless they aren't affected by the surrounding stimuli. 
Tsunade stated. What power? To think Naruto's chakra would be this powerful after lying dormant for so long. Jiraiya stated in disbelief. To turn a rock into dust with a single strike requires a great amount of power. The question is how did his chakra become this way? Minato nor Kashina showed any signs of having similar chakra. Tsunade asked her old friend. Could it be something recessive? Jiraiya asked. I looked up the available information about both of their heritage and found nothing. Tsunade explained. Minato was a rare individual from a regular shinobi family who had no bloodline, while Kishina, though from the Uzumaki clan, only showed her ability to perform the usual adamantine chakra chains and the other usual Uzumaki bloodline traits. Um, perhaps it's a mutation that developed as an effect of 11 years ago. Jiraiya wondered aloud. Perhaps, and if that's the case it would explain as to why he was unable to produce a single drop of chakra until now. Tsunade concluded. That still wouldn't explain why it is she didn't show any of the same traits. Tsunade, keep it quiet on that part, we don't know if he can still hear us, and it's best he doesn't learn about her. Jiraiya whispered to her forcing her to cease thinking of the topic. Sorry, for now though we should try and see if we can get him to stop. Tsunade apologized before they both tried moving up towards Naruto as they did they were nearly struck by Naruto's thrashing chakra. Well it seems that's out of the question, any ideas? Waiting is an option since we don't want to necessarily harm him, and his chakra is exceptionally dangerous, besides he should be stopping soon, since we never specified how long we wanted him to do this. Jiraiya pointed out as they began to wait on Naruto, unaware that he was no longer conscious, but instead deep in his subconscious. Opening his eyes Naruto instantly recognized that he was in his subconscious. Huh, I was just trying to practice my chakra control, and somehow I ended up inside of here. Naruto muttered to himself as he looked around before being nearly swept away by fierce winds as King Ghidorah flew overhead. Hey watch it. Landing on top of a large mountain of stone, Ghidorah looked down at Naruto's tiny form and simply chuckled. You're nothing but an insect, why should I be careful around you? Ghidorah mocked as he situated himself on top of the mountain. By the way how do you like your chakra? Naruto was surprised by the fact that Ghidorah had just asked him a question about himself. I don't know, I only remember that time when I charged a kiba, and everything after that is a blur. Naruto stated causing Ghidorah to grin. And how do you know about chakra if you're from outer space? I can see the outside world by looking through your eyes, and I can hear things through your ears. Ghidorah answered, though he noticed Naruto was looking at him confused. Aside from that I have other ways of finding out information that I won't tell you about. Naruto glared at the golden dragon skeptically. A chuckle was slowly forming in the middle head's throat. Naruto was questioning his response already. It seems as though you do have a brain to think with. Ghidorah bellowed in laughter at his host, causing Naruto to intensify his expression into a glare. As for your chakra, you should be thanking me because there was some kind of seal suppressing it. This alarmed Naruto almost immediately as he wanted to know where that came from and why it was restricting him from the beginning. How did that get there and how did you destroy it? Naruto immediately began asking much to Ghidorah's annoyance. How would I know when it got placed there? I destroyed it so that's that, as for how I blew it up, I used my powers to destroy it during your pathetic match against that mutt. Ghidorah answered before recompassing himself as he wasn't about to let Naruto get to him. Now listen to what I'm about to tell you Brad, this concerns your chakra and the reason it's like it is. Wait, what's wrong with my chakra? Naruto asked before receiving a bolt of electricity striking towards his side startling him. Never interrupt me kid. Ghidorah bluntly stated, although Naruto felt like it was more of an order. When I destroyed the seal that was placed over your chakra, I inadvertently caused your chakra to mutate upon using my gravity beam to do so. This has resulted in your chakra becoming dense and wild, and from what I have just heard from your guardians, it seems to rival that of those called Jinchuriki. Jinchuriki. Naruto repeated as he knew full well what a Jinchuriki was due to his godparents being Sanin. He remembers the stories he heard from them of how Jinchuriki contained a biju within themselves. Power of human sacrifice. Is that what that means, how trivial, those who have power should be grateful for it and use it to make themselves respected and awed upon. Ghidorah retorted. Otherwise there'll be nothing but pieces of flesh for the starving beasts around them to gorge themselves over. If they did that then they would be hated even more, Naruto began. Hatred forms from more hatred, a long never-ending cycle that will go on for generations to come, peace is what everyone should strive for instead. I never said that you could go all philosophical in here kid, and whoever told you that was right about hatred, however, peace is but an illusion that mortals dream of only to be destroyed at the sight of conflict. Ghidorah explained. I have seen it many times while traveling the universe, and many times I was the cause of that conflict. You really are a cold-hearted monster aren't you? Naruto exclaimed at Ghidorah who snickered in response. Now you're complimenting me, first throwing idiotic philosophy down my throats, and now you're trying to butter me up. 
Ghidorah mocked as he leaned downwards off the mountain. Too bad I'm hard to please. Bellowing out once more Ghidorah reeled up back into a sitting position from atop the mountain he was currently perched on. Why is it that you really pulled me back here? Naruto demanded. You hardly seem like the type that would worry over someone else's well-being. You're right to think that way, because that is exactly what I'm like, however, since I have to stay in your body for unknown reasons I'm merely looking after my own safety. Ghidorah stated. That chakra is deadly and if you're not careful it will kill you, and then that will really piss me off. Wait you're saying as a trade-off for the stronger chakra I have to deal with the possibility of imminent death, Naruto exclaimed. This was not going well at all, and he was becoming terrified at the fact that the very source of power he had been trying to use for so long, finally surfaces only to be the cause for his own death, should he not be careful. It's not imminent, rather there will always be that possibility, so long as your body remains the way it is. Ghidorah clarified. If you don't want to die then I suggest getting stronger, your body will grow and adapt to this power, however, you must tread carefully from here on out. Then can you teach me how to prepare my body? Naruto asked Ghidorah who quickly denied the request. As I stated before you're too weak for me to consider training you in the slightest, consider this a test if you will. Ghidorah explained. If your body adapts to this new chakra and you become stronger, then I might consider you strong enough to train you, otherwise you'll nothing more than a liability in the making. His words were harsh, and Ghidorah wanted them to be that way. There was no need for weakness in his vessel, if there was then he would have to destroy it. Naruto just sent a glare towards the larger kaiju, while all three of Ghidorah's heads looked down at him. Ghidorah looked into Naruto's eyes and saw the strength held within them, but as he looked deeper into them there was fear, and that was all Ghidorah needed to see. Pulling his heads back up Ghidorah charged up his power, causing the Naruto's mindscape to erupt into a thunderstorm with fierce howling winds. You're still too weak, the next time you come back here you had better be stronger. Ghidorah yelled as he flapped his wings sending forth powerful hurricane winds directly at Naruto, forcing him into the air and out of his mindscape. This will be the last time I pull him in too. Now then where did I leave off while exploring this mind? Looking around Ghidorah quickly remembered and took to the air heading towards the location. Time to find out why I can't fully manipulate the boy the entire time I'm in here. Waking up from his subconscious Naruto saw that both Jiraiya and Tsunade were standing directly in front of him. Confusion was taking effect as Naruto was wondering why they were standing closer to him when they were further back beforehand. I told you it wouldn't take long, only 10 minutes went by. Jiraiya told Tsunade who waved Jiraiya aside while walking up to Naruto. Well we've concluded that it will take you quite some time to get used to your chakra, however, this just means that whatever jutsu you use in the future will be much more powerful. Tsunade started making Naruto a little confused. Why would they be more powerful? Naruto asked. Your chakra is naturally heavier and denser than a normal shinobi's, in fact it's almost as dense as a Jinchuriki's chakra, while using their biju. Tsunade explained to him. So whatever techniques you learn in the future will be much more powerful, although harder to perform. Naruto quickly recalled what Ghidorah had explained to him about his chakra. So, the density of the chakra determines the power behind the attack. Naruto thought before something else came to mind that he wanted to ask them. Does that mean that I have to try harder than normal? Yes, it may be hard for you, but we'll be beside you all the way. Tsunade answered. However, before we can do anything like learning jutsu we need to teach you chakra control methods that will help you control that dense chakra of yours. Jiraiya stated as he expressed his input. Now since the density of your chakra is far greater than a normal shinobi, this will require a particular touch that I think will help you. Okay, so these new chakra exercises, what exactly are they and how will they help me? Naruto asked Jiraiya who proceeded to fly through some hand signs before performing the summoning jutsu. The result was a puff of smoke appearing where Jiraiya's hand contacted the ground. Naruto had heard the stories of how his godparents were able to summon large summoning animals that they had contracts with, and how they were able to use them in battle against deadly adversaries. As the smoke lifted a small green toad with white thick eyebrows, white hair in a mohawk-like manner, and a little small goatee appeared. What is it Jiraiya boy, I was just about to have me some of Ma's tasty cooking before you summoned me unannounced. The small toad asked while seemingly annoyed. Sorry about that, but I wanted you to meet someone that will need your help. Jiraiya apologized before gesturing towards Naruto. The small toad in question looked over at the boy with analytical eyes, as he quickly picked up on the family resemblance. Is this Minato's son Jiraiya boy? The toad asked resulting in Naruto wanting to ask him some questions about his father. If so then why is it that his chakra is extremely dense? You didn't put it inside of him, did you? This caused Jiraiya to overreact as he attempted to silence the toad. But what in me? Naruto asked them as he was starting to question what the toad was talking about. And how does this toad know my dad? 
Naruto this here is Fukasaku, a toad sage from Mount Momboku, he's going to help you with your chakra exercises while I'm away and Tsunade's busy at the hospital. Jiraiya explained surprising both Naruto and Fukasaku. Wait you summoned me just to help train this kid in chakra exercises, Fukasaku exclaimed before hopping up and bopping Jiraiya in the head, sending his face into the ground. Tsunade merely shook her head as she expected this kind of response from the toad sage, especially considering that this was a request coming out of the blue. Holy crap that grandpa toad just took down Hirosanon. Naruto thought as he was a little terrified of this small toad called Fukasaku. Said small toad was busy yelling at Jiraiya, who wasn't able to defend himself much like when he angers Tsunade. Tsunade decided to get Fukasaku's attention so that Jiraiya could explain the situation to him. Lord Fukasaku, please excuse Jiraiya's rudeness, but the reasoning behind why he summoned you is rather important. Tsunade attempted to sway the small toad's favor. Looking over at the princess herself Fukasaku hopped over to her still annoyed. Jiraiya made it pretty clear that he wants me, a great toad sage, to help him teach a child how to control chakra, Fukasaku started. It's embarrassing that the child I once taught years ago would need help with such a trivial problem as this. That may be true, however, Naruto here has chakra that is far denser than a normal shinobi should have, unless they were a Jinchuriki. Tsunade explained making the toad rather curious at the fact of the mention of Naruto's chakra. Denser you say, well perhaps, wait no. The small toad exclaimed. Jiraiya should still be able to teach him chakra control regardless of the density, and even you who has a rather pristine chakra control, should have no problems with it. Ah if you just let us show you the problem, then maybe you would understand our situation. Jiraiya offered as he picked himself up from the ground. Though the toad was annoyed he wasn't unreasonable and would let them show him the problem. Fine Jiraiya boy, however, this had better not be a waste of my time, otherwise Ma will have both of our heads. Fukasaku stated as Jiraiya walked up to Naruto who had decided to remain quiet through most of the exchange. Alright Naruto you're gonna have to show Pa over there your chakra, so that way he can understand what it is we need his help on. Jiraiya explained. Naruto was hesitant, he remembered Ghidorah's words of caution when using this chakra, which made him quite nervous. Um, what if I can't manifest it like a few minutes ago? Naruto asked Jiraiya who placed his hand on his shoulder but still had a smile on his face. Then you won't have a living godfather anymore. Jiraiya stated jokingly, although Naruto could see the small tell signs of fear spreading across Jiraiya's face. Looking over at Tsunade she was also a little nervous, but Naruto didn't quite understand why, other than the fact that someone called Ma would have both Jiraiya's and the grandpa sage toad's head. Looking further back Naruto could see that Shizun and Tonton were hiding behind a fallen table, more than likely to avoid contact with the toad and to have it as a shield. Okay, I'll do it. Naruto reluctantly agreed allowing Jiraiya to release a small sigh of relief. Jiraiya walked back over to Tsunade and Fukasaku before nodding to her to let her know that Naruto was going to do it. Alright Naruto is getting ready, although we'll need to move back pa. Jiraiya stated causing a confused look to take place on the small toad's face. Deciding to humor him Fukasaku hopped onto his shoulder as Jiraiya and Tsunade walked back a bit from Naruto. Naruto you can start whenever you're ready. Feeling the pressure that was riding on this Naruto was a little hesitant at first, not just because of his current situation, but also because he didn't want to re-enter his mindscape and get yelled at again by Ghidorah. I'm starting to see why Shikamaru considers everything troublesome. Naruto thought to himself as he took the same position he did last time to gather his chakra. Taking a deep breath Naruto began to concentrate on the flow of his chakra. Fukasaku noted how the boy remained calm and noticed the position he was in. I see you've taught the boy the same meditative stance that I taught you long ago. Fukasaku pointed out making Jiraiya grin. A rather risky decision if you ask me, he could have ended up gathering nature energy. Believe it or not that was what I was hoping for in a way. Jiraiya stated surprising Fukasaku who hit him in the head again. What an irresponsible guardian. Do you want him to turn to stone Fukasaku yelled at him. I only taught him the part for focusing his inner energies, I didn't explain Senjutsu to him or anything, and the reason for that is because his chakra never surfaced until yesterday. Jiraiya mentioned. Hum again? Fukasaku asked as he wanted some clarification of what he just heard. Naruto wasn't paying the group any mind as he was focusing on feeling his chakra and attempting to balance his energies. It didn't take long for the tingly feeling to surface again, although this time it wasn't as weird a feeling as it was before. Concentrating more on his chakra Naruto delved deeper into the source until finally it erupted to life. Fukasaku and Jiraiya were in a heated argument when Naruto's chakra sparked to life, startling the old toad who looked onward with wide eyes. Feeling the power shooting off Naruto, Fukasaku lost much of his composure upon registering the feeling that it was emitting. Jiraiya boy, how did you get that boy's chakra to contain nature energy? Fukasaku demanding surprising Jiraiya and Tsunade. 
Um again Naruto doesn't have nature energy in his chakra, otherwise we would have sensed it beforehand. Tsunade stated although seeing the small toad sage sweating profusely as well as the expression he was barring, made her question otherwise. It's not enhancing his normal chakra like when either of you use Senjutsu, that chakra is infused with nature energy. Fukasaku stated. This boy isn't turning to stone, his chakra is like lightning from a raging storm, such power and ferocity can only be matched by nature itself. Jiraiya and Tsunade were speechless for a lack of better terms. Bukasaku watched as the chakra sparked and cracked around Naruto encompassing him within its light. This child. To be able to do such a feat has been unheard of for over a thousand years. Fukasaku thought as he took in the sight. Naruto was beginning to lose composure as he was starting to lose his control over his chakra. Eventually it became noticeable to the others when the visible golden chakra began to recede away seemingly back into Naruto, who upon release, let out a heavy sigh and decided to take a rest. Tsunade was the first to respond to the change by making her way over to Naruto and checking him over. Finding nothing essentially wrong with a blonde academy student she waved a sign to Jiraiya, signaling that everything was okay. So, Pa, what do you think? Jiraiya asked the small toad who was still reeling back from what he just witnessed. Jiraiya boy I must head back to Mount Momboku immediately and speak with the great toad sage about what just happened. Fukasaku stated as he prepared to reverse summon himself back to Mount Momboku. Jiraiya was taken back as he wasn't expecting this kind of reaction. Is everything okay Pa Jiraiya questioned only to see Fukasaku shaking nervously. What I just witnessed is something unnatural, Fukasaku began with a mutter. A child born with such a gift has been unheard of since the time of the Sage of Six Paths, let alone that chakra was as fierce as a thunderstorm. I must speak with the Great Toad Sage to learn what steps must be taken to ensure Naruto's future is secured. What exactly do you mean by that? Jiraiya was confused as Fukasaku wasn't explaining anything to him, other than the fact that Naruto's chakra is infused with nature energy for some reason. Suddenly his mind was hit with a stunning conclusion that made Fukasaku's reactions justifiable. Do you think that Naruto is the child of prophecy? That is what I intend to find out, Fukasaku stated. I will return to Mount Momboku first and speak with the great sage, afterwards regardless if the boy is the child of prophecy or not, I will assist in teaching him. A child being born with such a gift is but one chance in several generations and should be molded and taught to use that power for the better good. Very well I will tell Tsunade and we will await your return. Jirei replied as he watched Fukasaku River summon himself back to his homeland. Many thoughts were filling Jiraiya's mind, many of which he felt unprepared for. Turning to watch Naruto and Tsunade, who called over to Shizun to go and get some water for Naruto, Jiraiya didn't know what to expect from here on. If Naruto is the child of prophecy, then that means the other parts of the prophecy will begin to emerge. Finally snapping out of his stupor, Jiraiya made his way to the group to check on Naruto as well. He wasn't about to allow Minato's only son to draw on into something such as the prophecy without proper guidance, and he'll have to inform the third Hokage of his new decision. In the land of grass, a small shinobi village stood at the base of a massive grassland, with hardly any trees to be seen. This village was called Kusagakur, the village hidden in the grass, and it was one of shrewdest shinobi villages in the elemental nations. Known for their diplomacy, the village tries to stay one step ahead of the crowd by analyzing the movements of the other countries around them. That and their analytical sense of studying other techniques from other villages has made it, along with its shinobi, hard to read. However, the village was completely unprepared for when two teams of shinobi from Kanoha arrived at their gates. The guards on hand were suspicious since many of the shinobi wore white masks hiding their faces from view. One of the guards on duty walked over to the group to begin the procedures necessary to enter the village. That's far enough Kanohan in, we'll need to see your identifications and necessary documentation before you are allowed to enter our village. The guard explained as a Kanoha shinobi with spiky silver hair and a mask covering the lower parts of his face, walked up to him. We have an important message that needs to be delivered to the Kusakage. The silver-haired shinobi explained as he showed the guard a sealed document with the Hokage's seal. It's important that we deliver it to him immediately, and we ask that you please let us in quickly. The guard saw the seal and recognized it from among the many seals any guard on duty would need to recognize. It was genuine, more importantly it was the Hokage's seal with a kanji for dragon underneath its indention signifying importance. The guard quickly moved aside and allowed the group to enter, while the fellow guards were completely perplexed. Hey why did you let them enter without checking their IDs a fellow guard demanded. The seal on the document was the Hokage's with the kanji for dragon embedded underneath it. The guard replied a little shaky, causing many of the other guards eyes to widen. The very same seal that is only used before war breaks out. You don't think this has something to do with those folders that one of the other guards saw that were on their way to the Kusakage do you? A guard whispered to the others. You know the black and red ones with the assorted village symbols won them. 
Something tells me the peace and quiet won't last much longer. Another of the guards stated as they watched the group of Kanoha shinobi disappear from their viewpoints. Said group of shinobi were currently making their way to the center of the village, where they were to meet with its cage. Kakashi, do you think that the Kusakage will understand the reasoning behind this exchange? One of the mask anbu following the silver spiked haired shinobi. Let's hope so Tenzo, otherwise we'll have to resort to the backup plans that have been set into place. Kakashi replied to his colleague. This message should put some sway of the negotiations in our favor, although the rest will put up to us. The group continued onwards before they noticed the building they were looking for came into view. There is the hospital that was mentioned in the reports, three and four should be preparing right about now. Tenzo mentioned quietly. Let's hope it doesn't come down to having them move in. Yosh. I'd prefer it if it was just us involved personally. A loud voice sounded. The others turned to face a man in a green jumpsuit with a jonin flak jacket, he was wearing orange sweatbands on his legs and black hair done in a bowl cut. The additional members of this mission are not the sort I'd prefer working with. You can say that again, a man with short black spiky hair and a beard stated as he lit another cigarette. I'm sure that we are enough to handle this mission. For once I find myself agreeing with Guy and Asuma, this mission may be important, but Root shouldn't be involved. A woman with long black untamed hair reaching her upper back and red eyes with an addition ring in them agreed. This mission requires a certain touch those mindless brutes aren't capable of. To be fair Kurinai, Danzo told them to ensure the girl's safety above all else, so they will take her well-being into consideration. Tenzo mentioned. Surprising that the heartless bastard would say such words. Kurinai spat. That warhawk is only concerned about the girl because she is important to the village and he'll think of her as nothing but another tool. The other members of the party heading to the Kusakage decided to remain quiet, mostly as to not get riled up with the other jonin, and because they were on the job and it wouldn't look well for Kanoha if its Anbu complained about some of the heads of interior. Turning another corner their destination was clearly in their view now. It was three stories tall, however, it wasn't as large or glamorous as the Hukage Tower back in Kanoha. The design was simple and yet elegant at the same time, the building had the kanji for grass on it and it was there that their mission would truly begin. We have a few days to negotiate and head back to the village, normally this type of mission would take about two weeks in order for everything to be done properly, however, we don't have that sort of time and the Hokage needs us back as well. Kakashi stated to the group. Let's just hope this doesn't actually lead to a war. The heavy burden that the group had to carry with them to this village was about to reach its destination, although many of them were all wondering whether the negotiations would succeed or fail. Hoping for the former rather than the latter the group picked up the pace a little, as they had a very important message that needed to be read. The representatives of the Hokage from Kanoha made their way into the main government building in the middle of Kusagakur. Only two were allowed entrance, Kakashi and Tenzo, while the others had to wait outside until the meeting was over, in order to learn how the negotiations went. For Kakashi and Tenzo, they were both keeping their wits about them as they knew full well that the Kusakage was someone that should never be underestimated. Kusagakur was an information hub for any and all information across the elemental nations, especially pertaining to their bordering neighbors. This was a result of the Third Shinobi War, when the land Kusa resided in was turned into a battleground and resulted in it becoming subjected to the terrors of war. The Shinobi of Kusa are considerable diplomats as they carry an uncanny sense of analysis for both politics and Shinobi techniques that has allowed them to remain one step ahead of the other nations around it. This meant that Kakashi and Tenzo were about to be in the presence of a shinobi, whom is considered the best in his village of shrewd analytics, with that in mind they made their way to their destination. Upon arriving at the door to the Kusakage's office, the secretary knocked on the door before checking with the Kusakage to see if he was ready for them or not. Once given the go-ahead the secretary moved out of the way and motioned the two Kanoha shinobi into the office. As the two entered the office they took note of how the office was sparsely decorated with decor, leaving much of the room to appear plain. At the back of the office was a panel of windows that would allow the Kusakage to look out at his village and observe from afar. There were no pictures of any past Kusakages, which was another difference when compared to the Hokage office back in Kanoha. They took note of how organized and spotless everything was, including the desk, which even back in Kanoha was something of an oddity, as they expected to see papers or assorted documents on the surface of it. Sitting at the desk in a brown leather chair was a middle-aged man around the same age as Kakashi and Tenzo, with the traditional Kusakage garments that had hints of light green on it and his hat that was laid down right beside where his hands were resting on his desk. He had short brown hair that was slightly unruly with green eyes and a scar across the right side of his face. His expression was blank, as to be expected, not betraying his thoughts in the slightest. Tenzo was glad that he was still wearing his Anbu mask, but he knew he needed to keep compassed because the Kusakage is expected to be able to read an individual's body language. 
Kakashi had similar thoughts as he also kept himself compassed and made sure to keep a sense of calm about him. Come forward, I'm not going to kill you or anything. The Kusakage motioned the two over with his hands. The two did as they were asked and were waiting for the Kusakage to speak first. It's not every day that I get visitors from one of the big five, especially Shinobi. It's an honor to meet you Lord Kusakage, my name is Kakashi Haddock, and this is Tenzo. Kakashi introduced. Yes, the son of the infamous White Fang and the forbidden experiment created in a tube, I am already well in depth with whom is standing in front of me. The Kusakage stated unnerving both men at the fact that he knew who they were, specifically Tenzo. Come now, it shouldn't be a surprise that I know of his past Kakashi, after all this is Kusagakur where we make it our business to know everything. Kakashi and Tenzo remained silent as they watched the Kusakage pull out a file from one of his desk drawers, before placing it out in front of him and closing the drawer. Opening the file the Kusakage took out the documents and sorted them to his own accord. Once he was finished doing that he held up a document and began looking over the details once more. I trust that you two are aware of the confines that these documents hold, correct? The Kusakage asked nonchalantly while never looking away from the document. Yes, all of us that were sent out onto this mission were fully informed of the information prior to setting out from the village. Kakashi answered. This way this exchange could go by quicker and easier for both parties as you are a very busy man. Indeed I am, running my village is my top priority, and anything that takes me away from my work prolongs the development and prosperity of my village. The Kusakage replied bluntly. Both Kakashi and Tenzo slowly began to realize that they were facing a man who was far more than they were expecting. The suddenness of this request is very unlike the Kanoha of the past, but not entirely so since it did make our nation a battleground. My Lord Kusakage, we apologized long ago and even funneled in funds and assisted in reconstruction, surely you must realize that we weren't the ones who intentionally wanted that war. Kakashi expressed. You must have known that it was a Wagaker that infiltrated your homeland in order to strike at our borders, we were only trying to repel them during the Third Shinobi World War. Do not forget that I was alive during that time Shuring and Kakashi, and believe me when I say that I hold more of a grudge to Iwa than Kanoha, as for what I meant was the sudden surge of shinobi sent over into our lands, combating against Iwa and ignoring the safety of my people, many of whom were slaughtered in the conflict for supporting Kanoha. The Kusakage mentioned while temporarily setting his gaze on Kakashi before returning to the document. However, I also remember the aid Kanoha sent, it helped my family and others, but for many others it was too late for them. The unsteady silence sat amongst the people in the room, none of them were speaking only observing. The Kusakage let out an annoyed sigh before placing the document back down upon his desk and sitting back into his chair resting his head on his hand with his arm prompted up on the arm of his chair. His postured exclaimed boredom, but his facial expression displayed neutrality, a sense of confusion and unfamiliarity settled into Kakashi and Tenzo's minds. The exchange will not happen. The Kusakage stated abruptly ending the enduring silence of the room. What? Tenzo accidentally stuttered out loud. Need I say it again, the exchange will not happen. The Kusakage repeated with a little annoyance evident in his voice. Tenzo was confused as to why the Kusakage was refusing such a beneficial deal in exchange for seemingly nothing. Kakashi though remained stoic as he began calculating exactly what he would need to say within the next few moments. A something within the deal unsatisfied you Lord Kusakage. Kakashi asked gaining the attention of the Kusakage away from Tenzo. May we hear what the reasons are so that we may appropriate changes to the deal. This caused the Kusakage to subtly raise an eyebrow as though not expecting such a response. Do you have the authority to change the deal at will Kakashi? The Kusakage asked of him. Yes, it was stated by the Hokage that we are allowed to change the deal within certain parameters that would better support the transition of this deal. Kakashi explained. The Kusakage then straightened himself up in his seat as he pulled up a specific document from the many on his desk. This girl is very important to your village isn't she? The Kusakage asked driving the conversation into a new direction, but a move that Kakashi knew would happen eventually. Yes, she was a relative of one of our late shinobi, whose will was recently discovered that entitles her to an estate, and one of the wishes that was contained in the will was that she would be returned to Kanoha to live where her family once did. Kakashi explained in detail. Interesting, when did this shinobi die, and why did it take so long for the will to be found? The Kusakage questioned in an analytical way. Kakashi though remained strong as he thought back to the example that he knew of personally for ideas. She passed away about 11 years ago this past October, and as for her will you may recall the little incident our village had at that time, and how we were still finding dead two weeks afterwards, not to mention the loss of valuables and displacement of personal property. Kakashi began. Someone had originally mistaken one of her dressers for their own, and not long ago realized that there was a board in one of the drawers that was hiding the will, upon discovery they turned it into the civil service department. 
And why was it that I did not receive any official documentation of this will? Surely if this was the case, then the civil service department would have sent along documents to prove this accusation. The Kusakage pointed out causing Kakashi to flinch slightly. Damn this man is shrewd, Kakashi was doing decent up until now, but how will he fare now? Tenzo thought as he looked over slightly to his companion and noticed that blank expression Kakashi had, that to anyone else meant nothing, but Tenzo knew that Kakashi was bested and currently lost. Kakashi. Tenzo was now more worried than prior to taking this mission. This guy is really starting to push it. Kakashi noted while keeping his expressionless mask on to make it harder for him to be figured out. This guy is clever, as to be expected, asking questions that are continually pressing down onto the receiver, trying to crush them and make them practically putty in their hands. However, that won't work here, not since Lord Third gave me the one phrase that can turn this around. Um now Kakashi explained to me why it was that the documentation was not in order. The Kusaka urged. Tenzo was growing slightly concerned that Kakashi didn't know how to respond, he hadn't given any clear sign of change from the same stoic expression since his flinch. Kakashi finally broke his stupor, much to Tenzo's immediate relief, however, the main concern of whether or not Kakashi still had an excuse or not was still pressing onto his mind. Well there is a reason for that, however, I was not entirely informed as to the reason for the documents not being organized and sent to you on the account that our hokage is having to focus on many black binders with red bindings. Kakashi answered quickly receiving a flash of understanding from the Kusakage as to what Kakashi was referring to. I apologize for not stating it first, but I'm not well informed in this matter, none of us who were sent out on this mission were. We only know that the administration is seemingly in frenzy for unknown causes and is trying to restrain itself. I see. The Kusakage started to remove himself from his prone posture, as the mentioning the binders seemed to have caused the man before them to tense up, and both Kakashi and Tenzo noticed that the man was trying to restrain himself in front of them. In light of that information reaching me now, I can see why the documents wouldn't have been sent along with the sudden notice. We do apologize for that, the notice itself was made in a hurry and was only able to get passed on after Lord Third happened upon a conversation between two administrators. Kakashi explained to the Kusakage. The Kusakage seemingly understanding the situation in Kanoha knew about the hardships one would have with their administration during such times, however, there was still something that needed to be said. I can sympathize with Kanoha's administration, however, I will not work liars sent to get whatever their cage wants. Bakashi and Tenzo tensed up as they weren't expecting anything after such a response prior to this. What are you referring to Lord Kusakage, are you implying that we, the envoys of the current third Hokage, our Kakashi began before being cut off by the Kusakage? Lying, yes you are, honestly who do you think I am? The Kusakage mentioned causing both Kanoha Shinobi to curse silently. Mixing lies with truth is an easy way to make something sound convincing, and in any other case you would have gotten me, however, as Kusakage I am made aware of every single move a shinobi makes in the elemental nations. And the recent death of your Jinchuriki has caused Kanoha to search outward for potential candidates to host the Kaiubi. Both Kakashi and Tenzo were flabbergasted at the sudden statement that was just thrown at them, and questions began to forage in their heads as to how such delicate information that was supposed to be covered up by Jiraiya personally be discovered at all. The Kusakage though was getting far more annoyed than before as he looked at the two. I hate repeating myself, it should be of no surprise that I would know this information, honestly were you implying that we are a bunch of armatures over here? You would be foolish to think so. The Kusakage exerted as he applied slight force into his words to ensure that the message was clear. To think that Kusagakur has enough skill and resources that they would be able to obtain information that only a select group even know about and is protected by Jureya's spy network. This is a threat to any and all national security if anyone is able to obtain even this classified information, let alone any of our troop movements or our village's current number of shinobi in the village, at a given time. Tenzo thought as he came to realization of the threat that was in front of him. Kakashi was adamant in his decision making, not really sure of what he should do next, Kakashi decided to just keep going. Lord Kusakage, such information shouldn't be available to you, considering the group of people who know this information and the individuals keeping it from surfacing. Kakashi stated. If you want to know we weren't planning on selling it or anything, just keeping it handy as we waited to see if you were going to come over our way for our Yuzumaki to make her the next Kaiubi Jinchuriki. The Kusakage mentioned as he leaned back into his chair and crossing his arms. It's always important to have your cards in order when it comes to dealing, but of course Kanoha sends in someone who can meet our demands in exchange for the girl, something that was foreseen. You can't imply that you expected us to show up all this time, Tenzo spoke aloud causing the Kusakage to do something that was the first during the whole time they were there, he smirked, but he didn't just smirk he was grinning from ear to ear as he chuckled at their plight. Honestly it wasn't hard to deduce that you would come here. 
You need an Uzumaki first and foremost and I have one, but of course you could have found one somewhere else, but considering they're near extinct, it's safe to say that there are only a handful left with that useless boy in your village and the girl in mine. The Kusakage boasted causing both Kakashi and Tenzo to send daggers at the man for his comment on Naruto. Careful now you wouldn't want to cause an international incident that could jeopardize everything that your village has been working so hard to achieve. Both Kakashi and Tenzo were really starting to despise this man as they realized just what kind of person he truly was. So, it seems that there are snakes in the grass after all. Kakashi retorted. Please, spare me any of your banter, as a cage I have to put my village before everything else, and in this case I'm going to exploit this whole event to my favor, and you can't afford to say no. The Kusakage chuckled. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. You don't know what you're doing do you if you anger or village you know full well what would happen to you. Tenzo exclaimed at the man. Oh, what's the old monkey going to do? Sick that old hawk at me. They're nothing more than old sacks of flesh that are good for nothing but wasting air. The Kusakage replied. This angered both shinobi as they respected their hokage, not so much Danzo, but nobody disrespects their leader. Then pray tell, what would your demands be if say we were to continue these trade discussions? Kakashi asked wanting to know what exactly they had in mind from the very beginning. Heh, if we were to exchange the girl then we would be loosing out on a powerful bloodline, one that could help make us stronger, so if we're going to exchange her, we must receive something of equal value in exchange. The Kusakage stated making both shinobi realize what it was they were after the whole time. In exchange for the girl you must hand over either a Hyuga or one of the surviving Ichiha clan members, otherwise this deal will be considered void. All you leaders are the same, wanting bloodlines in order to make yourselves stronger, it makes me sick. Tenzo abruptly stated as his emotions were starting to get the better of him. He was about to make a move on the Kusakage just for that alone, but Kakashi brought his arm out in order to stop him from doing anything of the sort. I'm afraid such demands are not in our best interest Kusakage, having to separate a member of either clan from their families is a rather painful sight to see and could emotional damage the person if not treated properly. Kakashi countered. A true statement yes, but here at Kusagakur, we would ensure that they would live a comfortable life in exchange for establishing a clan here in our village. The Kusakage explained. You would deny them active role in your military? Kakashi questioned. Considering that one of those clans was just recently a victim of a failed genocide, resulting in nearly three-fourths of it being wiped out in a single night and the other suppressing half of its clan members, I'd say that it wouldn't matter considering they would be far safer here and be allowed to do as they pleased. The Kusakage countered back. Do you even see them as human beings Tenzo demanded? Well you see the girl as a tool for your own means of war and protection, so I see anyone with a bloodline the same way. The Kusakage responded back with the last part stinging both Kakashi and Tenzo. Honestly, everyone knows that Jinchuriki are nothing more than tools created so that they could be used for the preservation of the elemental nations. In essence they're no longer human once they have that demon placed inside of them. Bakashi was reaching the limit of his diplomatic skills, he had tried everything that he learned from his sensei and even the suggestions that Siratobi gave him. Faced with the difficult task in front of him a heavy feeling of dread spread itself across Kakashi's being as he looked at the man in front of him, blocking his way to freeing the girl and taking her back to Kanoha, where she would have a better chance at a peaceful life, so long as her status isn't revealed. Even then the info could be leaked by Danzo, however, she wouldn't be the only Uzumaki either, considering Naruto he would be thrilled to meet her and at the very least try to become friends with her. Thinking about it some more he realized that she would more than likely be protected at all times by Anbu in the background and Tsunade and Jureya in the foreground. The Kashi knew full well what the life of a Jinchuriki is like considering the stories he heard about Kashina in her past and how his sensei was always there to help her and make her happy when she was down. The same could very easily happen, but so long as people are there for her then maybe. I think this game has gone on long enough, either meet our demands or leave, I have other things to do today and you're just wasting my time. The Kusakage stated aloud. Kakashi reflecting on his passing thoughts was fueled with new ambition that became evident in his posture and gaze, something the Kusakage noticed. Indeed this game has gone on long enough and now you're going to agree to the exchange presented to you. Kakashi declared with force causing the Kusakage to scowl out of spite. You dare to order me, I hold all the cards here Kakashi, or did you forget that? The Kusakage exclaimed. Tenzo looked over at his companion and noticed the look of determination that was evident in his lone eye, the same look he saw when they were confronted by Root long ago. The Kashi began reaching into his back pouch while never removing his gaze from the Kusakage, as he remembered the last words that his Hokage gave him before leaving for this mission. The Kashi, I fear that even if you try your hardest to convince the Kusakage into accepting the deal, he still might not take it. 
Saratobi mentioned to Kakashi who was standing in front of his desk, getting the last amount of details before meeting up with his assigned team for the mission. What do you mean Lord Hokage, surely I should be able to persuade the Kusakage into accepting the deal. Kakashi tried convincing his leader. A man such as him may be shrewd, but I have Sensei's teachings at my disposal, as well as your guidance and authority in these dealings. That might not be enough this time Kakashi, the Kusakage is the best shinobi that Kusagakur has created, he is cunning and terribly shrewd. He will drive the conversation to places that would be meant to corner you, and he will push you until you'll submit to his demands. Saratobi stated. Because of this I can only see him wanting something of equal exchange for the young girl. You don't mean that he would demand someone from one of the clans just for her do you? Kakashi asked for clarification, to which Saratobi gave a sad nod. Yes, it would be well in his character to make such a demand in this case, which is why I will give you something that will ensure that he will follow the exchange that was sent prior ahead of the team's formation. Saratobi explained to Kakashi as he opened up one of his bottom drawer and pulled out a medium-sized box before placing it onto his desk. Lord Hokage, what exactly are you giving me? Kakashi asked as his concern began to grow as the third Hokage's face began to darken as he unlatched the box and began to open it as to reveal the contents within to Kakashi. Pulling out a cloth-covered object from his pouch, Kakashi began to remove the cloth off to reveal two scrolls of differing colored frames, bindings and seals. Kakashi made his way over towards the desk of the Kusakage, whom was confused as to what Kakashi was bringing before him with such a confident yet slightly remorseful presence. Just to let you know, Kakashi began as he stopped in front of the Kusakage. This could have been avoided. With that Kakashi placed the two scrolls next to each other, with the seals facing the Kusakage for him to see them and the terror that enshrouded them. The Kusakage's heart nearly skipped a beat as he looked down at the two scrolls laying before him on his desk. Two lock and finding documents that bared a seal of a different cage. The one on his left was a scroll with black bindings with a red frame and the Hokage's seal present on it. The other also had black bindings, but it differed in that it had a dark green frame with the seal of the Kazakiage on it. The man was not looking at the signature seals however, but the kanji imprinted below the two of them. Both of them carried a deathly aura about them that made his stomach sick as fear began to take grip over him. The mark of damnation was upon both of them, the very same mark that above all things meant absolute death, the kanji for Oni, the declaration of war. Lord Kusakage, it saddens us that we weren't able to make a deal work, but we must go now for we have to get ready now, Kakashi began as he motioned for Tenzo that they were going to be leaving. Don't worry we'll be back soon though, and maybe then when facing two large shinobi forces, you will consider making a deal with us. Kakashi began to make his way out with Tenzo, but was stopped by the Kusakage who yelled out to them. Wait. Please take these back with you. He cried out. I cannot accept these, if I do it will mean certain death for my village and the end of our nation. The Kashi just turned and glared at the man who was slowly but rapidly beginning to break down before him and Tenzo. It's as you said Lord Kusakage, no more games from here on out it's all or nothing. Kakashi replied causing the man to falter and leap out of his seat and run around the desk to grab both Kakashi and Tenzo as to stop them from leaving. No you mustn't leave. He yelled out in terror. If you leave then war is declared and I will be forced to accept both declarations. The man yelled. He was breaking, and Kakashi and Tenzo watched as the man held onto both of their wrists with all his might so that they couldn't leave his office. Lord Kusakage, you are aware of the dangers you are placing yourself in by holding both messengers in your village correct? Kakashi asked with a dark tone. Because you do know that if we do not leave regardless of the declarations being accepted or not war will still happen. The Kusakage immediately looked at his hands and nearly shrieked in fear as he quickly released the two of his grip before falling to the floor. Kakashi and Tenzo were now making their way over to the door, they were almost to it, when the Kusakage yelled out to them once more. Wait. I accept the prior exchange for the girl. There is no need for war. The Kusakage cried out, causing both of them to stop in their place and turn to look at the broken man in front of them. I accept the exchange of an increase in trade of up to 15%, the joint economic financial plan that would increase Kusagakur economy by 15%, and new jutsu being delivered quarterly for the next three years. Kakashi waved Tenzo to go ahead and go to inform the others that they were finished here, while well, he stayed and walked over to the now broken Kusakage. Lord Kusakage, you are an amazing politician, certainly one of the best Kusagakur has created in the past decades. Please get up, it is unbecoming of a cage to be one the floor facing a foreign shinobi in his own hold. Kakashi stated as he pulled the Kusakage up onto his feet and back into his chair around his desk. Even though the man was broken now Kakashi still knew that the man was still prideful, and ending on such a note would have ruined him, something the third Hokage knew about prior to sending a team to retrieve Karen. You helped me up even after I practically gave you an ultimatum and demanded outrageous claims from you in exchange for the girl. 
The Kusakage questioned as he didn't believe the past few seconds even happened. Politics is an evil game Lord Kusakage, you should know that better than anyone else. You were made to believe that you had all the cards in place, Lord Third was right to create this plan, because now you have no choice but to listen to what I say, and that shouldn't have had to happen. Kakashi explained. Here you are a leader of a fine shinobi village breaking down before a shinobi of another land and being played around like an instrument, Lord Kusakage, you must understand the situation better than I, considering that Lord Third was hoping that by merely mentioning the binders that you would be reminded of the importance of this exchange. I might not know everything that happens in an administration, but my former sensei was Hokage, and I know firsthand the kind of pressure running a village can have. Kakashi let those words sit in the Kusakage's head for a few seconds before going back around the desk to stand in his previous spot in front of the Kusakage. The man, now trying to repair himself, sat in his chair thinking hard at what Kakashi had said, and shame became evident on the Kusakage's face. I remember the time when my family was attacked by Iwa Shinobi, they had gotten the lead that we had assisted a group of Konoha Shinobi by giving them shelter and food. They rounded us up along with other families that had done similar things and took us to an open field where they were going to execute us. The Kusakage took a pause as Kakashi could only guess that not everything that he and Tenzo were told in the beginning was entirely true. All of the men were gathered up and were the first to be murdered by them, they wanted to torture us with this execution, which was why they took away our pillars of strength that protected us. Then they gathered all of the women and they did horrible things to them before killing them though as they took time to relish in their vices, many were killed in the process. Finally it came down to the children who were now orphaned and scarred for life at the images before them. One by one they began to kill us off before only a few us remained. They were initially going to let us go as a warning, but they were growing tired of doing that and so they decided to kill us all off. It was in that moment I knew that I was going to die, that I was going to tortured and killed for the enjoyment of monsters. Tears were evident coming down the Kusakage's face as Kakashi had a hard time watching the man explain his past to him, to him it was torture. The funny thing is though was that fate was only kind to us few that had made it up to that point, as Konoha Shinobi stormed the field and stopped the Iwa Shinobi from killing the rest of us off. The fighting was quick and merciless, with none of the Iwa Shinobi standing, and only us survivors, and the group of Konoha Shinobi left alive in that bloody field. Many of the Konoha Shinobi recognized us survivors and soon realized why we were targeted, and they helped, treated our wounds while also taking care of our dead friends and relatives by burying them in marked graves. Out of all the shinobi that were there however, only two stuck out. The Kusakage stated as Kakashi got drawn in for some reason. One of them was a jonin with blonde spiky hair and blue eyes, and the other was a young chunin that had gravity-defying white hair and a stoic expression. Both of them found me and assisted me, helped me by carrying me to one of the secured towns being protected by garrison Kanoha forces, and saw to it that I was given immediate medical attention. It was because of them that I'm here today, and now I have besmirched their kindness with my own selfish desires. As true as your statement is, you were looking after the only family that you had, your village, so in a sense you are not entirely faulted. Kakashi expressed. Besides I believe one of them said that you should always keep your head up and keep looking forward and never forget the love that your family had for you. The Kusakage remained quiet as Kakashi removed the two scrolls from the Kusakage's desk and placed them back into his pouch. You may take her, there will be no need for the deal. The Kusakage stated getting Kakashi's attention once more. As leader of Kusagakur I am responsible for the safety and well-being of my people, today I am reminded of the dangers that will present themselves. In accordance with my actions I have caused enough problems for my village and nearly endangered it with war, as a leader I have failed, and as to make amends, I will just let you have Karen for you to take back to your village. The Kashi was silent as he bowed in acknowledgement and made his way out of the Kusakage's office, but before he was entirely out the Kusakage made sure that he heard his one and final request. The next time you visit your sensei, tell him I said thank you and that I will learn to be a great person just as his student was. The Kusakage asked before turning around in his chair to look out at his village, allowing Kakashi to leave, although this time with a sense of renewal on both parts. The village bristled as the seasonal winds blew through carrying the sense of spring through the air. With it came the warmth of the sun that bathed the world in its luminous gaze, filling the world with life. It was due to these natural occurrences that village was alive and prospering with a well-functioning economy and a strong military the village was able to thrive and culture was allowed to develop and grow. It has been only a few days since Naruto's chakra had emerged and yet he was starting to make excellent progress. Every afternoon Fukasaku would be summoned and help in assisting in Naruto's development. The first major concern that both the old Toad and the Sanin had was that due to Naruto's unique chakra composition that chakra control would be impossible with Sinjutsu, however, that was starting to not be the case. 
Naruto had begun to learn how to control his chakra more effectively as was evident when he managed to run up a tree and making it all the way to the top before losing traction, resulting in him tumbling down and being caught by the old toad. It was a sign that their efforts were paying off and Naruto overall was improving considerably. In the academy he was now on equal par with many of clan heirs and has even closed the gap between himself and Sasuke. This however was not entirely unforeseen as prior to not having Chakra Naruto had already learned the course material from Jiraiya and Tsunade, which elevated him into the higher level of education, as evident with his test scores, and since he never had access to Chakra, his Tajutsu was all he had to defend himself with, so it was refined thanks to Jiraiya. But since Chakra never flowed about his body, he couldn't muster up the strength to compete with any of the clan heirs. His ninjutsu skills were still low, and his jinjutsu skills hardly existed, however, considering his rapid development, since his chakra manifested, and under the guidance of proper instructors, Naruto was starting to become a prodigy in his own right. To Naruto, he was just glad that he finally had chakra to call his own. Currently Naruto was finishing up the last bit of training for the day with Fukasaku, before the old toad would have to leave for dinner. So what is it like on Mount Momboku? Naruto asked a toad as he continued to lifting the object that was in his hands. Ah, a paradise for us toads, where lily pads are numerous and delectable delicacies are practically flying about through the air. Fukasaku explained although he wouldn't know it, but he had just given Naruto the wrong idea, as Naruto envisioned toads on lily pads, watching Raymond fly throughout the air. Perhaps one day when you've mastered your chakra and become a fine shinobi, I'll take you there to train you in the same arts as that fool of a pervert that is your godfather. Wait you're saying that I could one day become a sage just like Iro san and Naruto asked with a hint of glee in his eyes. This got the old toad chuckling as he hadn't seen such admiration since Jiraiya first stumbled onto Mount Momboku long ago. Technically speaking yes, however, you have great potential Naruto for your chakra is a storm that can only be rivaled by your determination. You could become a sage of Mount Momboku if you wanted, but opportunities will open up in the future that might be more promising for you, so keep that in mind. Ukasaku explained as he received a puzzling look in response to which the old toad merely shrugged off and made a comment about youth and eventual understanding. I think that this will be a good stopping point for you Naruto, we can carry on tomorrow where we left off, so you can put it down now. Naruto did as the old toad said and put down a stone statue of a toad that was brought over from Mount Momboku by Fukasaku. It wasn't quite as large as the other ones he found around, but it was twice Naruto's height and weighed in close to a ton. Your chakra gives you strength, that fierce storm inside of you will require much more to break it, but the fact that you've managed to lift that statue up and down repeatedly for close to 10 minutes is a large step to mastering your chakra. Fukasaku acknowledged allowing Naruto to feel proud of his success. Due to your rapid advancement we will double the amount of training tomorrow, and we will push for in half an hour tomorrow. That made Naruto suddenly regret putting in the extra effort on the side as he began to reflect on much that had happened this past week alone. His thoughts drifted back and forth between the changes that he was facing, as he is now being forced to stay at a compound again under Tsunade's watch. Although she couldn't get time off of the hospital to supervise Naruto's training with Fukasaku, so instead she managed to let Shizun get off earlier than before, so that she could be there when she could not. Naruto looked over across the large yard of the main compound and saw Shizun and Tonton waiting on the sidelines. Shizun was currently catching up on the news by reading the Kanoha Digest, while Tonton was resting on the pillow next to her. Naruto, is something bothering you? Fukasaku asked regaining Naruto's attention. You seem to have spaced out there for a minute. Oh, yeah it was nothing I was just thinking about something was all. Naruto answered with his usual happy-go-lucky grin, though Fukasaku could see through the mask quite easily. Um now boy, you honestly expect me to fall for that, need I remind you that I was the one that taught Jiraiya practically everything he currently knows. Fukasaku pressed as Naruto thought on what he said, and a couple thoughts came to mind that made him give the toad a skeptical look. What? Iro Toad. Naruto stated causing Fukasaku to gawk before jumping up and whack him across the head. Ouch what was that for? Listen carefully Naruto, I'm going to get something straight with you before this becomes a thing. I didn't teach Jiraiya until after he was like that, in fact he had the audacity to ask if the chameleon summon Senjutsu could help him camouflage himself in order to enter hot springs. Fukasaku retorted. If anyone is to blame it should be that man sitting in the Oval Office, because he was Jureya's first instructor, and as such the one whom imprinted the most into what he's become today. Naruto, for his part, thought about something in his head that came to mind after hearing what Fukasaku said. He remembered a time when he was with Jureya, and he was handing a book to Saratobi, the third Hokage, who was flabbergasted that he would do such an exchange in front of him when he was so young. 
The look of disgust and shame spread itself across Naruto's face as he quickly realized what it was that he had experienced long ago and just how far the image he held of the third Hokage had fallen because of it. So many perverts are living in this village it's almost as though this is a hub for them or something. Naruto remarked under his breath although Fukasaku heard clearly and chuckled. That may be true, however, this village is full of other types of people, many that resent those like your godfather and other that could care less. A village consists of many different people with varying views and opinions, so make sure you remember that if you still want to be Hokage one day. Ukasaku stated and getting an understanding nod from Naruto in response, acknowledging the usefulness of it. Now I believe that will be it for today, I can't keep Ma waiting forever now. Take care Naruto boy, I will see you again tomorrow. But that Fukasaku disappeared in a cloud of smoke from his reverse summon back to Mount Momboku. Naruto remained in his spot though for a few moments though, as he reflected on his progress and the words that Fukasaku gave him before leaving. Naruto let out a tiring sigh of relief as he stretched a little gaining Shizune's attention as she had looked to see the puff of smoke from Fukasaku's reverse summon. Are you done for the day Naruto? Shizune asked getting Naruto's attention. Oh, yeah the old geezer Toad just left, although his training just keeps getting harder. Naruto moaned as his body was still burning from the exercises he did today. I have managed to get further into channeling my chakra, but during that last exercise my chest was burning and I felt like I was going to throw up at the end. Shizune not want to take risks at the paper down on one of the arms of the chair she was sitting in and got up to make her way over towards Naruto. As she began making her way over towards Naruto, Naruto began to feel odd. His vision was slowly beginning to blur and the burning sensation in his chest was returning. Within a few moments though his body seemed to lock up as he stumbled over just barely retaining consciousness, this alarmed Shizune as she quickly, along with Tauntin, raced over to the prone figure of Naruto. Naruto. Shizune yelled as she quickly began to see if he was still conscious, and much to her nerves, she was thankful to see that he was still aware and responsive. Hang on I'm going to examine you real quick. She quickly began to check him over and found the anomaly quickly and shock was evident on her face before masking it and quickly began treating Naruto before turning to Tauntin. Tauntin, quickly fetched Tsunade, it's an emergency. Not long following that Naruto slowly fell into unconsciousness, becoming unaware of everything around him. Off and on he would slip in and out of consciousness, but altogether it seemed that time passed each time he regained and lost consciousness. Before long he remained unconscious as he drifted into sleep. Several hours had gone by and Naruto was none the wiser about what had transpired throughout that time, only knowing the emptiness he was feeling and the urge to sleep. Outside though Naruto was unaware that he was currently being placed in a bed in the compound by Shizune, while still being checked over by Tsunade. They were in Naruto's room which was dimly lit so to not disturb Naruto, especially after the whole ordeal that he was experiencing. Leaning against the frame of the open window he was sitting in, Jiraiya watched from afar while Tsunade and Shizune treated Naruto. Jiraiya had in his hands the papers that they got from their hospital trip prior that evening, which he had been looking over before placing them into his coat pocket. It seems that he was lucky this time. Tsunade commented before removing her hand from Naruto's chest. The illuminating green hue of her healing jutsu dimmed out of existence as her hand parted from Naruto's body. I fear that these attacks might become more frequent Jiraiya, this was the third one since he began training. The terrible side effect of that chakra no doubt, it would have been different if his chakra coils developed in accordance to support that power within him as he grew, however, that isn't the case here. Jiraiya stated as he watched Naruto being cared for by both Tsunade and Shizune. Tantan was right next to Naruto the whole time winking softly hoping to try and soothe him of any pain that he might feel with her soft sounds. His chakra is as heavy as a jinchuriki's, and what's worse is that it can damage his nerve endings of his nervous system, we managed to repair most of them, but a couple of them will need to be healed over time in order for them to return back to normal. Tsunade mentioned as she placed her hand back onto Naruto's chest in comforting manner as she watched his haggard breathing slowly return back to normal. He nearly had a stroke today Jiraiya, tomorrow he could have a heart attack. We need to lessen his amount of training, otherwise he could become fully paralyzed at the very least. I know Tsunade, but he is so determined to get stronger now that he has his chakra after so long, now we might be forced into limiting him in what he can and cannot do. He already doesn't like being back in the compound. Jirei replied remorsefully. He wants to pass his own parents and become something that he can feel proud of. Please Jiraiya, inform Lord Fukasaku about this, he cannot proceed into these severe training regiments without knowing about Naruto's condition, it was foolish of us to not inform him when happened the very first time. Tsunade stated while never moving her gaze from Naruto. I guess we don't have any choice now, and I think that it would be best to also inform Sensei. If we want Naruto to get stronger, both will need to know the hazards he will be facing. Jiraiya admitted as he exited out of the window and began to walk away from the room. 
Lady Tsunade, should I inform the academy that Naruto will not be able to attend tomorrow, just to make sure that he gets the extra rest? Shizune asked as Tsunade let out a soft sigh before nodding her head. Naruto will more than likely not wake until tomorrow afternoon, until then we need to make sure that the academy understands this. Tsunade stated before getting up along with Shizune. Shizune I'll need you to stay with him tomorrow and ensure that he is comfortable, while I try and look into ways that could possible help prevent this from happening as frequently. Adding a nod of acknowledgement Tsunade began exiting the room before turning back around to look back at the sleeping form of Naruto. Next to his prone form was Taunton, whom was keen on staying by his side throughout the night. Looking over at the little pig Tsunade formed a sad smile as she watched the scene. And you, you make sure you watch over Naruto, okay. Tsunade stated to Pig, who turned and snorted in understanding before turning her attention back to Naruto. The two women made their way out of Naruto's room and separated as they went to their own respective rooms within the compound. Before long any remaining lights within the compound were turned off leaving it shrouded in darkness. Outside the main compound Jiraiya was making his way towards the Hokage's office when he stopped to make sure that the two women had gone to sleep. After waiting for a couple minutes Jiraiya watched as the last bit of light was extinguished, allowing for him to do what he needed to get done. You can come out, I know that you're there, ghost. Jiraiya implied as he waited for seemingly somebody to appear. The wait was not long however, as a familiar sound filled the nearby area, as a spectral figure emerged cloaked in black. The figure was rather tall, but that was all that could be seen at first glance. The clothing the figure wore prevented any indication of whom this person was, even their face was covered by a single solid black mask with two eye holes for the individual to see out of, though no one could see inside of them. The figure remained where it stood, not moving in the slightest as it stared directly at Jiraiya, who was unfazed by the seemingly dead gaze directed at him. Jiraiya for his part was rather serious, but not seemingly on the defensive nor the offensive. For him Jiraiya was standing there waiting for a reply from the being, but not to his surprise he didn't receive one. Silent as ever ghost, you know for someone who's been watching over Naruto his entire life you're an oddity considering you hardly speak. Jiraiya stated although the figure didn't change in the slightest causing Jiraiya to sigh in annoyance, before attempting to strike a conversation from the reserved individual. Look I'd like to thank you for appearing again and transporting Naruto to the hospital rather quickly, it was thanks to you that everyone there was able to prevent a stroke or worse from occurring. The figure continued to remain prone to which caused Jiraiya to visibly twitch in annoyance. You know it's rude to not respond to somebody who is trying to thank you for saving another's life. Jiraiya retorted. Funny coming from the guy who's always trying to peep on women while they're bathing at the hot springs. Ghost replied back causing Jiraiya to jump as surprise. Come now Jiraiya, did you really think that I couldn't talk? Well considering past encounters I'd say my response is justified. Jiraiya answered as he watched Ghost disappear before his eyes. Touring at the new source of chakra next to him, Jiraiya quickly turned to see Ghost balancing himself on top of a lamppost that stood near the gate squatting and looking down at Jiraiya. Also you need to quit doing that it's rather creepy. On the contrary, what I do is intended so that other individuals are unaware of my presence while I follow and keep a close eye on Naruto. Ghost replied. Yeah well he's currently resting, and so that means you don't have to keep that up all the time. Jiraiya remarked only to get a slight chuckle from the obvious other male that was looking down at him. Look, I'm going to be leaving the compound to go speak with Sensei, I don't want to come back and hear that Naruto was abducted under your watch, you hear me. The only response Jiraiya got was a sudden coldness that filled the air as though death itself was nearby. Do not worry Jiraiya, Danzo has failed many times prior to today, in trying to get his hands on Naruto, Ghost began, as Jiraiya noticed that Ghost was pulling something out from underneath his cloak. And yet no one has ever set foot onto these grounds. Ghost then tossed a round object over towards Jiraiya, whom caught it and was quick to identify it. The object in his hands was a plain white mask with the kanji for root on it. Jiraiya also noticed the blood stain that was across the mask, and yet upon examining the grounds around the compound, there wasn't a sign of a battle present that Jiraiya could find. I see that you're still quite skilled, a shame that I still don't know your name, only the name you took on when you began your solemn watch. Jiraiya mentioned as he pocketed the mask into coat for later. He began to continue on his path to the Hokage Tower, as he headed to the gate to which Ghost was waiting at still perched on top of the same lamp post. He continued forward until he was in whispering range near Ghost when he stopped for a brief second. Make sure that no one gets close enough to him until he's able to defend himself properly, I don't trust Danzo, not since the failed Ichiha massacre. Jiraiya whispered to Ghost, who neither responded nor showed any signs of acknowledgement. Also we can't have Naruto getting another episode when he eventually becomes a shinobi, hopefully though he can get past this, but if not. Ghost didn't respond as he knew what Jiraiya was intending to say. 
Jiraiya continued his way over to the Hokage Tower as he exited through the Senju gates, not looking back to see ghosts disappear into thin air. This is important I just hope he knows that. Jiraiya thought before jumping into the air and landing on a nearby roof in order for him to get to the tower quicker by jumping across the building tops instead of through the streets. At the same time a group was just returning from a mission and was making its way towards the Hokage Tower as well. Their intentions were different than Jiraiya's, however, the importance was just the same as the news he carried would be as necessary for the third Hokage. This group was escorting a very important person who was about to start her new life in Kanoha and was unaware of the future that she would have here and the difference it would be when compared to her stay in Kusagakur. Two different lives affected by the events of their past converge on each other, unaware of the plan that was in store for them. As the heavens gleamed and the earth watched onward the stars dance around these two lost souls to guide them in the dark. With new challenges ahead one could only guess the outcome these two would reach. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.